Hello, hello. Happy Saturday. How is everyone? How you doing? Good morning. Good afternoon. Hello, everyone. We are we are live and we are ready. We are ready to go around here. It is nice. I got to tell you that the fact that we don't change our clocks in Arizona actually gain an hour. It's kind of weird, isn't it, Mario? It is. Because we're ready at, totally ready. at 9 a.m. or it's actually 10 a.m. now, but you get it. It's 9 a.m. Happy Saturday. Hello, Creative Escape. Hello, Erica. Oh, hello to Italy. Cool. Hey, Susan. Hey, Karen. Cindy. Hello, Margaret in California. How are you? Been a while. Yes, so we've got, it is going to be a fun morning. Morning, Daniel. Karen, Mary. Mary in Surprise, Arizona. Surprise. Mario's surprise. over there again. <laughs> Mario's over there getting figured out. I, we always joke about that. You know, if you live in Surprise, you're like, where do you live? Surprise. Oh, no, you can tell me. It's hey, Gail. No, it's a surprise. <laughs> Sir Stamp a lot. Hello, hello. It is going to be fun. Today is a, a fun demo. I will tell you, though, really, the table behind me is, it's overloaded to way more than I could probably get through. So, hey, Vicky. Hey, Roseanne. Hey, Kathy. Probably, really, um, uh, are all my shirts plaid? Not all my shirts are plaid, but the, I, I call this like my dress shirt for live because nor normally I'm wearing a Mickey Mouse t-shirt. It's your uniform. True. It's my, it's my work uniform. But I do like a good plaid. Um, but no, I, ha I have solid shirts. If, if you see any things from CHA, I usually dress a little fancier for that. So um, hello to everyone. Holland, Denmark. Cool. Cool. I think I agree, Kim. I'm an overachiever. Here's the thing. I, I always talk about my popcorn brain, and I think that's good for any maker is that if you have ideas, there, there's nothing wrong with like getting all of those. Oh, thanks, boo. I love my plaid hey, shirts everyone. too. Hello, Monty. I do. I like plaid. I like plaid shirts from Buckle specifically. So yes, um, only Buckle. Yeah, that's how it is. Scrapbook.com. Good morning. Hello to Carol. So yes, hey, when, when I'm prepping. Hey, Zoe. Hey, Julie. Hey, Tracy. I do like to prep a lot of different ideas because uh, you think? one sparks the next and i think that's the true sign of of a maker that just we, that we like to do right <laughs> this is what we like to do so uh when i'm prepping i probably get more out than what i need hey christina hey courtney yes um i i don't know how much i'm going to get to we'll have to see you got a lot of stuff yeah but hopefully what i what i tried to do this was the challenge yesterday when i was prepping last night um is to try to provide some techniques that are going to be useful for the holiday making season, not just the basics. Because again, if, if you're here and, and you're new and you want to learn the basics, there are a lot of demos on timholtz.com. You can just go there and search. You can type in a product that you're interested in learning more about, distress, alcohol, ink, crayons, whatever that is. And there will be several live demos that I've done uh, that you can learn about that. So I, I tried to get a little highlight of stuff, but of course, specifically, you show your table? yes, I did. Today is about stamps and stencils. Uh, so I wanted to do techniques that incorporate stamps and stencils. There, there is an extra one that, that uses an embossing folder, but you know, that's it. Hello, Ranger. I think I saw Kathy Z as well. Yeah, Karen, Lisa, Hi, Terry. Hi, how's Jim everyone? Mark. We got, we got a lot to do. So, um, I'll do <laughs> fancy, 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 shirts, are fancy the best. shirts. I know. See, and Kathy Z, because if, if you if you follow Kathy Zilski, you know the struggle is real when you do videos because you feel like you have to show up with like a shirt, but then you pick out a shirt. And I'll be honest, like when I do a series of lives, like this is the same shirt I've worn for part two and part one, and this will be the same shirt I wear for part four because when this is over, this shirt comes off, and I put on like I just call them normal clothes, I guess. But I mean, this is normal, but. But not for not for just working around the studio. So anyway, that that's just what, that's uh, what it is. Dina says, "Hey, scoot on over and let Mario have a few minutes of screen time." There you go. That's not gonna happen. Yeah. So there you go, Dina. This if, is Mario's it, perfect screen if time. If you watch right. the live, then you know exactly what happens. Right Tim there. leaves the frame. That's so does Mario. So right. I'm like his safety net. So see. I am behind. Do you see what I mean? Seats. If I'm here, he's here. See? If I leave, he leaves. Then I'm out. So there you go. That's. That's why we do it. Never being rude to Mario. I know they, they love to see, but it's true. Yeah. Do you see how that worked? Yeah. As soon as I go. I like it over there. <laughs> he's, out of, he's out of here. He's not, right. the, he's not the camera guy. No. Yeah. Empty frame. You're totally right, Zoe. That's what it is. Yeah. So. Empty frame, empty head. You know, it's me. Yeah. Hello to Stampers Anonymous. So, uh, oh, hey, Kabir. So, yes, this one, uh, I'm going to do my best to try to answer questions as I go through. The demos are very random, uh, surprisingly hey, enough. But again, it will be about um, hopefully just some ideas that you guys can incorporate throughout the holidays. So if you have questions, as always, 
uh, feel free to to fire them off. I'll try to answer them. Mario will uh, if I talk see about it, I'll, that. I'll bring it up too. Yeah, I think it, it's going to be good because hopefully you guys have at least started making for the season. Maybe you haven't been into full making mode right now, and that's okay. It's okay if you're not in full making mode. Yeah. But as we get closer into holidays and like as the days kind of count down, you start seeing that that countdown to Christmas. That's when people start to get a little panicky as makers and you throw in the towel, right? You're like, okay, I thought I was going to. I've been following for months and I had the, the, the best intentions of making something, but you know what? It's almost the end of November. I haven't even started, so forget it. No, 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 no. As makers, we know that we can we can pull out all the stops even last minute. That's just who we are. So I want it to be an enjoyable process. That's the whole idea of making that. Maybe if you had uh, goals in mind for the making season that you were gonna send out 200 Christmas cards by now and you didn't, okay, maybe you need to kind of give up the goal. Well, I don't know what it is, but you know, maybe you need to kind of give up the goal, but that doesn't mean you need to give up the make because I've always said that, that just being creative as a maker, that's what brings you happiness and that's really what it's all about. So you kind of have to let that, that pressure go and you might surprise yourself that you kind of have a really good creative afternoon, a creative day, a creative weekend, and yeah, even if you've, I saw someone say they just finished three cards. Well, that's great, right? So just accomplishing something, that's okay. So that's the other thing to remember as you watch these demos, whether you're watching them live or the replay, yeah. Yeah. you just kind of want to, to, to kind of give up the pressure of that. So hello, Tifa, Craft and Mama. Hey, Kath. Hey, Stacy. Right, Stacy? 200. Well, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> people always say that they're making hundreds of cards, so that would have to be more than one, right? More than 100. So I don't know. <laughs> That's how I am. Okay, we ready to get started? We are ready. Here we go. I am too. Yeah, one is better than zero. You're absolutely right. Hello, Ann. Hey, Susie. Yes. Hey, Paula. Hey, Susie. Yeah, we could just hey, Nikki. We'll chat all day. So here we go. Let's let's get into it. It's a blank canvas to start, but man, there are a lot of things going on. So today is all about stamps and stencils, and I wanted to share just some of my favorite uh, techniques that I like to to definitely pull out for the holidays. There's some great inspiration out there. I'm not gonna go into too much detail about all of these. Again, there are more detailed videos specifically talking about that. But when you go into make, and you'll see for um, a lot of techniques for this particular demo, surfaces are key. Play around with different surfaces because some of the techniques that I'm going to share with you um, are better on different surfaces, right? So you can't have just the magic surface. So as always, if you see a technique and it's not working for you, uh, go back and just make sure you're paying attention to the surface because that could impact everything. As far as supplies, use what you have, right? As long as what you have works, use what you have. Uh, I'm just gonna talk about different inks as we go in and, and do some stamping. And the first one we're going to do is uh, a favorite technique. Now, this is a technique that uh, as a stamper, you probably know about doing uh, like double stamping, right? Some people call it uh, monoprint, some people call it double stamping, some people call it kissing. Actually, I know Vicki Booten refers to uh, when you're touching ink to ink as kissing, but it's really about taking an image, right? And this could be any type of stamp, but an image that has a lot of solid surface and apply some type of pattern to it. Now, this particular one I'm gonna share with you uh, Stacy, who's one of the makers and she's here, uh, she has a tutorial on her blog. I'm going to share that, that demo. I'm going to technically like demo that tutorial. Um, but she's got way more information on her blog. So, um, I, I think Mario or Zoe can maybe throw up a link, but you can also go to the makers page, but you can see like great step out photos of how Stacy actually shows you how to create something, a finished, a gift tag idea using this technique. But yeah, it just involves any kind of stamp that has a solid area and then some type of smaller pattern that you can uh, overstamp. But of course, when we're doing this, there are many ways to achieve it. I'm going to share with you um, the technique that, that Stacy shows as well, because that's how I like to do that as a maker, which just involves ink on ink, uh, using it on the same stamp. But if you're not into that, I will share another tip of how you can do it if you get a little weird about uh, incorporating inks because some makers do, all right? So what the end result is going to be, so what I'm gonna use, I'm gonna use the new, uh, the Bold Tidings Mini, right? Now, if you don't have the mini ones, this is also a great technique. Oh, let me grab my stamp binder. I've got stuff a little everywhere, right? Let me just bring this in. Ooh, this is another favorite. Hey, that's a Zoe card right there. Um, so Bold Tidings, this is the, these were uh, a series of stamps that came out last year, right? So there's four different sets of, 
of bold tidings. And they're just really big. What's up? Something up in your camera. Oh. Can no one see anything I'm doing? Uh, I only see your work surface, sir. So. Oh, what do you... You guys, I've been demoing the whole time to a blank screen? Wow. Okay. Does any does everyone else see a blank screen, or are you the only one that sees it? Uh, only, I mean, I see that, but. Well, let's let's see. Let us let us find our. <laughs> Can't see anything except the grid map. Oh well, you guys, I've been demoing this whole time. I can see it. Okay. Um, let me see. Wow, what's going on here? Um, that's strange. I'm gonna I'm gonna switch back to Mario for just a second. No, my, he. <laughs> He ran out of frame right away as soon oh, as I said go. that. Okay. I yeah, I just got to see what's right. I have to <laughs> just see what's what going on. <laughs> no, it's that's so crazy. You guys, I I was like already in full demo mode and yeah, you guys you didn't see anything. But here's what's weird. Look, if you look on eCam, that can't see? That camera's yeah. got a live feed. Okay, let's let me let just, just Yeah, I'm just going to I'm going to click this really quick just to see if you guys see anything and oh, we'll wait all right. now try clicking back over yeah so let's see oh there you go well let's see if you guys see i'll wait just a second he does have the best smile do you guys see stamps everyone see stamps? let's see it's usually like a one minute delay that in live world seems like uh, forever i see a live feed i see stamps and a dancing hand so there we go do 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 anyone anyone see? Got it. We yes, see we them. See Excellent. All Moving right, on. Hey, why don't you start a demo? Okay, let's start a demo. So, thanks. Isn't that crazy? I mean, you guys are probably talking going, okay, Holtz, like, can you show us something other than just your media mat for a change? Okay. So, we will start with this technique. Um, and again, this is the technique that Stacy has on her blog. So, you can check it out. Did you guys throw up a link on Stacy's blog? Right now, okay, maybe. Mario throw a link to, to Stacy's blog. Uh, but again, it's a technique that involves, now I can actually show you the stamp so you know what I'm talking about. An image that's going to have a solid area, right? Some, some type of surface, a landing area. It doesn't have to be words. It could be sometimes a, a shadow stamp, anything that's going to have a lot of solid area. And I do prefer this on a, on a rubber stamp, right? And then some type of pattern, right? Now for a pattern stamp, especially... Well, I just love this set. This is called Perfect Plaids. It's one of my favorites. It's one of Stacy's favorites too. It's a great plaid stamp because if you look at the rubber, it's very, very detailed. You see all those little lines? So when you use this, even as a background stamp, because these are great background stamps, but when you use it as a texture, you don't just get solid lines, right? So you really have to pay attention to the type of design that you're getting because what we're going to be doing is we're gonna be transferring. Now, sometimes people have done this technique where you ink up a stamp and you stamp it on an uninked stamp that you're actually lifting ink off. We're not, we're gonna be applying ink to ink. So we start out with a solid and we add a pattern. This could be a plaid, this could be a tiny polka dot, this could be whatever. So, we're using the new Bold Tidings Mini. These are the small ones that came out this year. Now I'll go back to my regularly scheduled program. There we go. And here was the Zoe card I was talking about. Um, because Bold Tidings, these came out last year. There were a series of four. And these are really cool. This technique is amazing for this one, of course, but I wanted to share the new minis. Uh, this is great because it's just one big old card front, right? These are big, bold tidings that go onto the front of a card. But you can see all of that wonderful solid surface. So a solid surface is going to be ideal for this. Now the mini includes all four of these sets, all of these different phrases on one set. Perfect for little gift tags, uh, smaller cards. This was a card that Zoe made um, last year when these came out, which is just another way that you can use uh, these bold tidings, which is kind of an offset stamping, where you first stamp with white paint, right? You can see that, where she essentially brayered some white paint on there, stamped, and then cleaned it off, and then inked up the stamp with, you can use well, you can try. I prefer archival for this. I'm not sure, Zoe, if you used archival or not, but then you're just going to offset it a little bit and stamp it a second time. So you create that drop shadow. So you can see uh, where that dark ink is that doesn't overlap the white, where the ink overlaps the white and where the white isn't. And that's just about shifting your stamp. But that's a really cool way to use uh, any type of a bold text. We're going to do a technique that involves adding a pattern to that bold area. Let me just move this off. Put my binder down. I, I mean, I'll admit, I got to show you. I 
because remember uh, on, on week one when I talked about loading the cart with stamps? Well, that was good for kind of my go-tos, but I will say that I did kind of pack like a little emergency binder because I included uh, some other stamps that I really like to use uh, in addition to some of the new ones. So there's no shame in that, right? I just now, so now I have a cart with stamps and a little binder. <laughs> That's important uh, because, you know, you need to have some creative options. So what this is going to achieve, and I'll show closer to the camera, take a look at that little plaid pattern on that bold text, right? So that's essentially having this, which would normally stamp a solid, and then having a pattern on there. And so what I wanna share is just about like different inks and different things that could happen. Because what's interesting about this technique is sometimes people just look at a technique and honestly, um, as someone that demos or teaches, there's so many times that people watch a demo and then they kind of tune out. They tune out all the really important stuff, which are products because they think it's just more salesy, right? They're like, oh, there he goes again, just trying to sell stuff. It's really not that. If you can find a, a surface or an ink where a technique works, then you do it. But if a technique isn't working, it usually has to do with the specific product. So I thought by making a little swatch, it would be really good. Uh, and Stacy talks about this, but I wanted to visually show you because sometimes people just read words and they're like, yeah, 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 okay. But here you go. Picture is worth a thousand words. The, the smooth part of a cardstock is what's also going to help this type of technique because you want as much contact to happen instantaneously as possible because we're essentially inking a stamp up twice and we're trying to get both layers of ink onto that substrate, okay? So we need to make sure that the ink is wet, but not too wet, and we need to make sure that the substrate grabs it. So for this, uh, and Stacy mentions this in her post as well, this is mixed media heavy stock white, okay? So that is going to be, oh, it's not mixed media, sorry, it's just distress heavy stock, my bad. I was reading the package of mixed media. It's actually this one, white heavy stock, okay? White heavy stock is 130 pound smooth. Uh, it's the same as, the same weight as craft paper, but this smooth paper really grabs ink. It does some cool things. Uh, Jen Shirkus talks about even, it's her favorite for like blending and doing water techniques. It's a very cool paper, specifically for stamping. If you're looking for a matte paper that has a nice smooth factor to it, but that stamps very clear, white heavy stock is good. Could you use watercolor cardstock? You could, you could use watercolor cardstock, but watercolor cardstock actually doesn't keep your image crisp when we're using these specific inks, okay? So this first one is showing inking the bold stamp in oxide and layering over the stamp in distress ink. So both of these include distress. So it's oxide in the back, distress ink on the front. And this is how uh, Stacy showed this one. Then this is the same technique showing it on watercolor paper. So it's exactly the same inks, oxide and ink, but just take a look at the difference just in paper. So can you see that even though this is the smooth side of watercolor paper, the detail of that plaid is more visible on the smooth white heavy stock. You see that side by side? So same ink, same pressure, same everything, right? I didn't try to cheat it. And does this work if this is all you have? Sure, it works but you can really appreciate all the fine details of that perfect plaid. You see why it's perfect? Like look at these little tiny lines in there. So even though you're stamping something, I mean smaller, this is my pinky by the way, I know I have pork chop fingers, but still it's small and you still get all of that great texture. It doesn't stamp in a blob. That's what I love about rubber stamps, okay? So the paper, right, just, just from go, the paper is key to this technique. But then it's like, well, what if, what if I don't have that? What if I just wanna play with inks? What if I have oxide and oxide, meaning I can ink with oxide and then I'm gonna overstamp an oxide. Does it work? Yes. Do you notice a difference? Yes. The difference is the plaid, which was stamped in ink, is more vivid or bolder than the one in oxide. Not a lot, not something where I would say, oh gosh, what did you do here? But it is different because remember, ink is just dye and dye is very intense. And oxide is a fusion of dye and pigment. So you're still getting the color, that's why you can see the black plaid in this one, but you're not getting the intensity of just a dye ink in black, okay? Now you might be thinking, well, wait a minute, if I'm stamping, like I know that if it's distressed, but I'm gonna stamp in something waterproof, so I'm gonna overstamp in archival. Or not, because archival doesn't work for this technique, okay? And the reason is, is will it stamp 
onto the, onto the ink stamp over here? Yes, it will. But will it transfer? No, it will not because archival is not staying wet enough for this to happen. So even though archival is a great stamping ink, it's not going to work with this particular technique very well, right? So then you think, okay, well then what if I don't have all this oxide nonsense? What if I'm just a purist, a distressed purist? Will it work? Yes, it will. Okay, well, what's the difference? Okay, let me go back to oxide and ink. There's not much of a difference, but it is a much smoother, creamier background on the oxide. Well, because that's an oxide versus just ink on ink because the inks, when you stamp ink on top of ink, they want to they wanna get together. They want to have a party. They want to play. So when you stamp the plaid on top of that solid, your black starts to wick immediately. Distress is designed to wick. And so when you put ink on ink, it's like, oh, hey, how you doing? Oh, cool. Let's get together. Awesome. And what happens is that plaid is not nearly as crisp as it is on the oxide and ink. Why? Because when this goes on the oxide, it's like, oh, hey, you're familiar, but I don't really know you because you got somebody else here. Oh, yeah, that's pigment. Oh, okay, cool. I'll stay here. So that is the big difference between oxide and ink and ink and ink. Does it work? Yes. Totally different, but it works. So then it's like, okay, well, what about ink and archival? Well, that worked a little bit better because now we're just dealing with inks. We took out the pigment from the equation. So we definitely got more than what we did on oxide, but I still wouldn't consider this a success because you don't really know that that's a plaid. It just looks like a dirty stamp eh, and maybe that's okay. Then you're like, all right, so I don't have oxides. I don't have even distress inks. <sighs> I'll sit a minute, let you think about that. Okay. But, but what if, but that's okay. If you didn't, what if you wanted to just change some things up? Maybe you just had archival inks. You can still do this with archival on archival. That's fine. But again, those inks, if you're dealing with compatible inks, they're just going to be a little bit more blurry or fuzzy than if you did oxide and ink. So I just wanted to share all that because it's easier to tell you that ahead of time before I start demoing, because then the questions are, well, can you do it with ink and ink? What about ink and oxide? What about ink and archival? What about oxide and archival? I just figured if I went through the whole thing, you would know why specifically we're doing smooth paper, oxide and distress ink, because that's going to give us the best result. Does that mean you can't do any of the others? No, go for it. You do you, but the, the success rate will be completely different. So I'm going to use distress ink, black soot as my top layer. Okay. Now, could you switch up colors? Well, of course you could, right? If you wanted to do, say, you wanted to ink this in kitsch flamingo because you wanted your words to be pink and you wanted your plaid to be red, absolutely, you could do that. But you would want to make sure that your ink, your, your top texture is going to be a deeper color than your base color for your words. That's really important. Okay, so for stamping, well, listen, you can use whatever you want. Throughout this demo, I'm gonna use uh, my stamp platform, so I'll use a stamping tool. But in this one, I also like to just use grid blocks. I'm a huge fan of these small blocks. I know these aren't for everyone. Some people just, just can't get past uh, the fact that these are thin and they don't have a rolled thing. For me, as a stamper, once you, once you learn to love this, there's no other way. Like, I can't actually stamp with an acrylic block because I, I can't feel what's happening. Right, I just got this block on there and I think I have to CPR because I can't feel that I've made contact. The other thing, I'm, I'm very used to having different sizes and I like that the grid blocks just have all the different sizes. So what I'm going to do are two things. I'm gonna put my word on this one, right? And we're going to just do kind of the, the overlap because for this one, it's just gonna be easy, easy to go ahead and create that. Let's do joy to the world. Joy's here, there we go, joy. All right, so when I use a grid block, I just take a grid line, right? Oh, when I use, I agree, Ted, grid blocks are terrific. Um, when I go in and use a grid block, I look at the stamp, right? So I'm not looking at the index. The index is ish, it's close, but the rubber is what's going to really tell you uh, how that's going to work. So I look at the rubber part and just try to make it somewhat parallel to a grid line, right? Once I do that, when I'm stamping, I can look at the grid line to get placement or position. Does that make sense? That, that's just what I like to do. All right. Makes sense to me. Makes sense to me too. If I understand it, <laughs> it makes sense. There you go. If you understand it, we understand it. Then it's your spot on. Then it's good. If it rings truth to Mario. Okay. So we're going to do white heavy stock. I'm just going to cut these down. Let me take this little guy. I don't know for you guys. It, it's interesting, like, because on the, 
the mini trimmer, I mean, I love the mini trimmer, but I, I'm not gonna lie. I have to say that for, for the season, this thing hasn't left my desk since it came out because I just find myself cutting down little things. I think creating those little stamped backgrounds much easier when you have just smaller pieces to work on. And so by having it there, I'm just not afraid to just chop things up, especially backgrounds that I did, okay? So our ink of choice is going to be our oxide. So we're gonna take our Distress Oxide. I think for this one, I don't know if I wanna do crushed all, I think I'm gonna do peeled paint. I think Stacy did mowed lawn. Um, I'll do peeled paint. I think I wanna do a red though. So maybe I'll do barn door as well for another one, just to, just to change it up. But we could do, oh, maybe I'll do a blue as well. Maybe I'll do weathered wood. Oh boy, Holtz, just one, one demo per idea. Okay, here we go. I can't get over it. So what we're going to do is essentially ink up our image with an oxide and ink our texture with a distress ink. Now you can put this stamp on a block if you want, but you don't need to because the stamp is going to remain stationary for this technique. But again, do what's going to work best for you. Now I will say that uh, Stacy goes through an entire additional process uh, in her tutorial on her blog where she'll talk about how to glitter stuff and all that. And she, she just has her own jam for that. So it's completely fine. Just gonna take the oxide. Tap, tap, tap. And what you wanna do is we wanna make sure that our stamp is covered in ink. So see how there's no ink there? We need to keep going. So tap, tap, tap. And another thing, like when I ink with an oxide, just any ink pad really, turn the ink pad, right? Turn it around. Don't just ink in the same area because we sometimes can catch different, different parts of our ink pad that ink it up. So there we go, you see? Inked up, nice. Then we're going to take our Distress Ink. This one is going to be in black soot. I'm going to ink up the plaid that I want to use. I like this open plaid for this. I only need to ink up an area that's as big as the stamp. Okay, just depends on what you're going to do. Then we're going to take this inked stamp and we're going to stamp it onto the inked stamp. Okay, just with purpose. And that's what's going to pick up that pattern. Then you're going to take your paper and we're going to stamp that as well again. See, I love that I can feel this. I don't know if you see that I'm kind of giving a little wiggle because I know that I'm making contact with that. And it's just that simple to have an oxide with a plaid. Couldn't be easier. If you were going to stamp another one, do you need to clean this off? You do because you have two different inks right now. So I still have, you can see that plaid on there. Could you get a second generation? Uh, you might be able to. Let me just do a second generation. Right, it's probably gonna be really faint, but cool nonetheless, right? If you like that faintness. So depending on how many you have to do, you can go ahead and, and work a second generation. But you do wanna clean off your stamp because that plaid is going to remain. That ink and ink is going to remain. So how do I clean it? I'm just gonna use water. These are water-based inks. Just gonna put a little bit of water on my cloth, referred to as the inky binky. Just wipe this off. Some people have stamp chamois, whatever you have, just water is going to take that off. Good enough, okay? So let's do another one. Let's create one with a barn door. So same rules apply. Now, because I inked green here, although it doesn't transfer much ink, I will say that it does transfer some ink. So I'm just going to go in and wipe this off again. Okay. If you happen to ink up a, a bigger area of your background and let's say you did the first one here, yes, you could pick it up over there, but I'll show you some other tricks, especially if you plan on doing several of these. Okay. Because you might be looking at this going, yeah, cool technique. But again, you know, we got that 200 card benchmark, right, Mario? Yeah. Yeah. 200. yeah. So another thing you'll see how I'm inking the stamp. See, sometimes I do things and I don't even pay attention to, to explain it, but like a lot of times I'll just leave my stamp here because when I'm inking it, you can see how it just spins on my media mat. So it's kind of rotating. Hey, Simon so, binky, so there you go. I do like that. It's just a, it's a flower sack towel, but I, I like it. They're very, I use it a lot. I do. I use it a lot. Okay. Let me ink this up again. Tap, tap, tap. We want to get a nice layer of both inks on there. You can also look and say, okay, well, joy is right there. Hi joy. Then we can, just take that and make sure that that boulder plaid is where joy is. See, again, I can have pressure, lift it off. Oh, look at that. Oh, it's gonna like that look. Okay, we're gonna stamp that one. Good pressure and dismount. Look at that, whoop, whoop. Okay, now we're talking, that's beautiful. Really just a cool, easy technique, right? 
Now, could you emboss this? You know what? You could. You could take clear embossing powder, and as soon as you lift that off, you can pour clear embossing powder on there, tap it off, and you can heat emboss this and emboss it. In fact, Stacy shows how she does some glitter embossing. We just do it a little different, but you could definitely put clear embossing powder over here and emboss it, but you need to work very quickly if you're going to emboss with uh, Distress Ink and Oxide, All right? Pretty cool. I like that. Just a fun way. Let's, let's still do a second generation. <sighs> a little warm breath on there just to see. You know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but oh, see, I like that too. I do. I'm kind of liking second generation. So for me, especially if you're sending out cards, no one's doing a card comparison, are they? Let's hope not. But here you can get double duty each time when you're creating this effect. If you had all your stuff pre-cut, you're like, I'm going to stamp one. Someone's going to get a dark one. Someone's going to get a light one. But you could definitely do uh, two stampings out of that technique using the same inked up image. Pretty cool. I think it's cool. But let's say you're like, hey, Tim, I... I've got to really get my, my make game going on. I don't have time to do that. There are some other ways that we can create this effect, okay? And the other ways would involve some type of stamping tool, which in a sense, I use my platform. Let me find it. I got to see where I put it. I have it buried under these ink tins. That's right here. There we go. It's like, I've got like Django over there. And you can use really whatever, whatever type of stamping tool. But just to kind of show you, um, and I won't take you through the demo, you'll get the idea. But essentially, let's say you were going to do a bunch of these. You, you just love this idea, you wanted to make tags. Excellent, game on. So you could take a sheet of paper, whatever size stamping tool you have. You wouldn't even have to trim down your paper if you didn't want to. You can place your paper down. You can use your magnets. You can really, however you want to, to create this. And then we could take several of these. So if you're like, okay, I, I've got this going on. Okay, I'm gonna go for the, okay, wait a minute. I, I wanna create this one. Okay, well, I need, to, I need to find something smaller. If these ever kind of drive you crazy, I'll show you another trick later in the demo about uh, if you wanna create stuff without magnets. But you could position these stamps on your background for however many of these you anticipate creating. I do like to stay uh, pretty much within this size and you'll see why in just a second. So this will allow you to get all your stuff. I keep bumping it. Positioned, right? You get the idea. Okay, merry and bright. All right, let me put the shorter one over here because that stamps longer. Okay. Then I'm, I'm kind of creating it where it's like, okay, I can do clean cuts that way. Chop them up, right? Yes, someone said sticky grid. You're right. Sticky grid is your friend uh, for this if you didn't want to do the magnets. So making sure that We've got rubber because that's what we're stamping with. We're just going to place this down, pick these up. Okay. Then what I would do is I would ink these up with my oxide. So maybe they're all the same color. Maybe they're different colors, whatever they are. I also look at this grid also, right? So when you look at the grid, see how Joy looks a little wonky? You can just, because you were using the same grid idea, you can adjust your text on this grid as well. That, that makes it pretty, pretty easy for me. All right. So... We would ink these up with oxide. We can do them all the same color, different color, okay? Then you have the option. You could do exactly what we did before, which is you could ink them up and then ink up the background, or you could go ahead and ink them, stamp, next, ink, stamp, next, ink, stamp, Next piece of paper, ink, stamp, you get the idea? I would be stamping all of my oxide layers because then I don't have to clean in between. So if you're making a bunch of these and you're like, this is it, this kind of saves the cleaning step. Then once you're done stamping them all, then you would clean them, leaving them on here, right? So when I do that, I'll just normally take this off. I'll spray this with, spray the cloth with water and I'll just wipe off my, my oxide layer. Then you would just go in, take your, background stamp and now we want to stamp with it with purpose so i would put it on a grid block there happens to be a grid block that fits this stamp exact because we want to feel it then i would do my inking stamp the entire set with a background put in my pre-stamped backgrounds that were stamped in red you guys getting the visual we'd put that in the same spot we'd stamp that in black boom there's our layer we could just wipe it if we needed to, 
stamp it again. But if you kind of get yourself a, a little rhythm here, right? So you're like, okay, I'm gonna stamp, maybe even put a piece of masking tape where you're like, okay, I'm gonna put my grid block right here. You wouldn't even need to clean every time unless you saw that the double stamping was kind of distorting this, but you could just do a quick wipe. But this way you stamp all of them black, doom. Take it out, put in your next pre-stamped, stamp again each time. Does that make sense? So there is a way always that you can see a technique that you like, but sometimes you'll look at that and be like, but I, I need to make so many. I just, I honestly don't have time to do a little inking, a little stamping, wipe it off. You can always do stuff um, in quantity, especially around the holidays. And that's what I was trying to, to talk about at the very beginning of the video, that there are gonna be some techniques, but hopefully there will be ways that you can see these and go, okay, yeah, I, I can actually make pretty quick work of this, right? So by having them this size on this piece of paper versus, oh, hey, I'm gonna get an eight and a half by 11, but your background stamp is only so big. So that's not gonna make it as, as efficient, if that makes sense, all right? So that's really what that little, that tip was. You can always find ways that we can take an idea or a technique. I'm never gonna fit these without looking at the picture, but I'll be fine. That's gonna work. There we go. Actually, I think I'll put this here. I'll put this here. Nope, I'll put this here. I'll put this here. Okay, I'm good with that. All right. So far, so good, right? Oh, that didn't stick. Easy, easy tip, but the result, the fact is very cool. And when you start looking at your stamps and you start looking at these kind of bold designs, and you start looking at your stamps going, okay, well, it may not be a word, but maybe I've got a cool flourish that I want to use, or maybe it's a Christmas tree and I want my Christmas tree to be polka dotted and I have a polka dotted background stamp, like maybe a Swiss dot stamp. All of those are going to be absolutely perfect to incorporate that. So that is our difference. She, uh, this is, I use the same color that Stacey did. This one's mowed lawn. I use peeled paint. So my swatches are that brighter green. So you can switch up your colors because obviously remember the brighter the color, the more contrast. Peeled paint, it's a little dirtier. Kind of like it like that, but obviously your, your image is just going to be slightly subtle. So you get to do what you want to create with your favorite colors. And I think the technique is really fun, really easy to do. Okay. Next up, we'll set these aside. I think I'm good. I don't know. <laughs> you never know where really where, where things are going right now in my, in my head. Okay. Next, I want to talk about what we can do with this particular set, because this set, uh, when I did these minis, it was inspired by a set that we designed a, a few years ago. And it was an idea that uh, Paula, Paula Cini had, and it was, it was called festive overlays. And it was, the idea was about taking, and the set came with uh, designs and words, but festive overlay was about taking an image, and inking an image in a color and then overlaying something bold, right? Now you could do this one on top of the next, right? In other words, you can, you can take that and you can stamp directly on top. But with these guys, I created uh, this mini set. I also added holiday things. So this is a new set this year as well. These are all vintage engraved illustrations for the holidays. I just love that. I love Santa, I love the globe. You can see some great inspiration from the makers on timholtz.com of, of how they used uh, these stamps in completely different ways. But the great thing about these is these were designed to work together. There are elements or icons specifically designed to work with a lot of these wonderful bold tidings minis, okay? Now, same rules apply, but not necessarily as much because we're not essentially stamping a pattern. So you have a little bit more creative freedom. I would say that all of them work. You can do what I'm gonna share with any kind of ink combo, but knowing how it's going to look, I think is what's going to ultimately um, be the deciding factor. So again, did a little visual swatch. So this is oxide and oxide, meaning you stamp your image in oxide, you stamp your tiding in oxide. Oxide and ink, oxide ink, okay? pretty much the same. I don't, I mean, you might look a little different if you're comparing, but to me, not visually enough and oxide and archival. Now, the only difference is you see a little bit more of that red coming through wherever it overlaps when you do archival. And that is because oxide is water-based, archival is oil-based and oil and water don't mix. So when you try to put this on top, it will stay, but you're always going to get a little bit of that color kind of seep through. 
just because we're doing uh, the oxide and archival. Same thing's going to apply for ink and oxide. So this is stamped in ink, stamped in oxide, ink and ink. Now, to me, this is just a little bit drier. This was just not good stamping on my part, but had nothing to do with the technique. And ink and archival, same thing. You can see a little bit of that red peek through, even though these are both ink, oil, and water, okay? Now, what's the difference between these two? Well, really, it's just about, I guess, the, the boldness, if you will. Oxide is going to stamp, if you look at Santa, it's going to always stamp a little bit more solid because it's got some pigment in there versus just the dye. So that's nice. But if you really want to go for something that is super intense, you could do archival and archival, right? We could take the, the archival, let me just see, where are these little guys? I think I've got them right here. So you could take a color of archival, any color archival ink, stamp the Santa and this guy, and then you could stamp an archival over the top. That's going to be totally compatible. So it's going to cover it up. So that works too. And really it works well on any kind of paper. So you could do this double stamping on mixed media, regular cardstock, craft, you can do all sorts of different things. Just the only difference in craft is you'd probably want to stick to an oxide because it's pigment and it's going to sit better. In fact, when you look, this is just kind of a, just a little example. There's so many different options, right? And could you stamp it directly on top? Yes, but because these are both scaled the same, offsetting it is really going to be the best. Right, so you can give yourself just a little visual of this. And you could do this with just an ink. You could go in and you could ink up your stamp with markers. There's a million ways that we could uh, add some characteristics to the back. But the key about this overlay is you wouldn't want to stamp your image in black and your text in black, even if you plan on coloring, because where those two meet, those words are gone. So the overlay is always going to be a color with some type of bold. And this is really great because these are super easy to do and it makes it look like well it just makes it look like you kind of know what you're doing right so let's just show you how we can create with this one let's do holly this time okay so i'm going to put the holly on this one then i need to find i call this the i call this the positioner it isn't but this allows me to position words it's essentially the same size grid block but it's just longer. It's kind of like for border, things like that. But for this one, let's see, Holly, Holly, Holly. What do I want to do for Holly? Uh, we can do Holly Jolly Christmas. I don't think I'm going to do that. I think I'll do it's the happiest season of all. Let's do that. Oh no, let's do Jolly. Why not? Oh no, I did that one. Okay, make up your mind, Holtz. Jeez, the struggle is real, guys. The struggle is real. Okay, so I'm going to position my word stamp on the end of this block, same thing, kind of lining up my words to the grid. You do not have to do it this way. You can do all of your stamping with one, take it off and do the other. You do you. You do whatever is going to be most comfortable uh, for you, okay? So this, I will take some oxide, get a couple of other colors. Move this off real quick. And you could do this with a stamping tool, anything you want. I'm gonna do just a couple of colors of of oxide. So I'm going to take my stamp, ink it up. Okay. This one happens to be just a little bit of crushed olive. Then I'm going to take peeled paint. These are very, very similar colors. Okay. This one is just a little bit brighter. Just wanted something just to add a little punch. You could do the berries. You really you could do whatever. Then I'm going to take this holly and I'll stamp it. Again, this could be distress ink, this could be archival, this could be whatever. But I just like the little, the little bit of blended tonality. You see that? See how we kind of have a little bit of green, then there's some olive. So they complement each other, but it's just not a solid image. It has a little bit more oomph. And by sticking with the same type of ink, you cannot contaminate your ink pads this way. You, you just can't. Even if they were different colors, even if this was green and this was pink, you could not contaminate your ink pad. You may get a color on the felt of that, but you couldn't actually change a color of an ink pad by putting ink pads on a stamp. The only way you would do that is if you re-inked it the wrong color, then that's on you. If you had an oxide and an ink, then you would contaminate it because they're not the same kind of inks. But if they're the same kind of inks, distress ink and distress ink or oxide and oxide, you can mix your pads onto a stamp, right? Then we're going to go in with our, our text. Might as well use, I think I'm for this one though, I am gonna use archival. I'm not bothered by that. I know some people are, you know, 
uh, where's my big archival? There it is, right? But you, we could work with distress if you want. I just always think when I'm stamping words, I just like to stamp with uh, archival. All right, so I've got that, that works. I'm gonna ink this up, tap, 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 right? You can see that. So here's why I like to uh, have this on a block when I say it's the positioner. This is going to allow me to position my stamp visually without my hand in the way, right? If my, if my text was on this block, can you see where I'm stamping? Nope, neither can I, right? So you're kind of like doing a little, a little side, side glare to be like, ooh, where is, it, where is this going? By putting your stamp on a, on a longer block, it allows you to visually go in and get placement of where you want, and then we can stamp, right? But because archival is permanent and because I was flappy flappy, I'm just gonna give it one more ink just so you see what I'm doing. I'll position it where I want it to be, right? Set it down, and then I'm going to still stamp with my fingers, right? So I'm not stamping from down here. This was only to place. I'm still gonna stamp up here, give it that nice little wiggly, and there we go. Wonderful, super cool, super easy. But again, that's just a little tip when you're doing this, especially if you were doing, as I said before, compartmental making where you had a bunch of gift tags, maybe these were gift tags that you die cut or you purchased or whatever it was, and you decided, okay, tonight, I'm gonna go in and stamp all of my images, right? I'm just gonna have a good time and I'm gonna stamp all of my images in different color archivals. I, I might do like 10 Holly and I might do 10 Santas and I'm just gonna do the color background because that's all the time you have tonight and then tomorrow or the next day or the next week, then I'll just do the verse stamping, right? Because you can do those days or weeks apart. This just really allows you to make each one either the same or unique, but visually you can see exactly what's going on. Again, just a tip, you can do exactly what you wanna do. If you have a stamping tool for that, you can do whatever works for you, okay? When it comes to stamping though, you wanna make sure, especially if you're gonna be stamping words for the seasons, that you have nice ink pads, meaning whenever you're, whatever you're using to stamp your words with, we want those to be visible, especially when we're doing things like these, these bold tidings. Sometimes people don't wanna do that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna stamp this one. I have an idea in my head, and if I don't get it out, my head is going to literally burst, okay? Taking a piece of Distress watercolor cardstock, this is going to get into the next technique that we're gonna do, but I just wanna give it, I just misted this with water. Can you see that? A little water droplet, got by my, my mister, just spraying in there. And I just wanna go in and stamp this just with a little bit of water, lift it up, okay? Don't judge. Don't ever judge watercolor. Watercolor, really easy. Two ingredients, water, color. If you don't want it to look watery, then you probably shouldn't do watercolor. Then you should just stick to stamping, okay? So it is important that when you stamp it, it looks wet. Now it doesn't, you don't want it to look wet where it's running off of your card, but you want it to look wet because it's going to give you a beautiful, very hand done look. You'll still get some detail, right? We're not hosing it down, but I do like that. I like the idea of watercolor, okay? And you don't need to move things in the air, right? It's, it's not like you're going to a department store and you're doing you know, perfume where you have to spray it in the air and walk through it. I mean, just spray with purpose, but make sure if you're using a distress sprayer that you, you commit because that's what's gonna give you the mist versus the splatter. Okay, archival. Notice when you ink archival, you need to ink it and then stamp it. So position it, place it, stamp it with your fingers, right? Because otherwise, if you stamp from down here, you're gonna get that little bend because you're not stamping straight on. Very nice, look at that. See, I love that. I like that, that look. And to me, again, it's a two for one. It's a two for one right there because I've got the same ink on the stamp. Could you do a third generation? The ink is telling me yes, right? It's gonna tell me that it's gonna be a little bit lighter because there's a little bit of drops, but hey, we're here, we're friends, we're gonna, we're gonna talk about that. Um, so this technique would work with oxide or ink. It doesn't work with archival because archival is waterproof. So if it's waterproof, it means it's not reactive to water. So here we go. See, that, hear that mist? Psh, that's what you want. But normally I don't like to mist over my paper because then essentially you're stamping on wet paper, which, well, that's a whole nother technique, but we'll stamp. Yeah, not bad. I wouldn't go this far myself, but you know, hey, you got 200 as your benchmark, there we go. Right? Well, you never know. So there is our 
There's our third watercolor. Not bad though, not bad at all. This one I'm gonna change. So, just wipe that off with a cloth. I don't, you could use stamp cleaner, or you could use archival stamp cleaner, but I think this one, uh, maybe I'll do good tidings, comfort and joy. So same thing, I always like to position the stamp on the grid line, right? You don't need to follow that rubber line, that would not be good, right? They do, they do their very best to, to cut them and index them, is good, but they are, at the end of the day, they're handmade. So, you know, you have to just, you pay attention to the rubber itself, not any of the other uh, stuff going on, okay? Archival, tap, tap, tap. Excellent. Let's see where this one, and this one, I think I'm just gonna go down a little bit further, because I, I wanna show off more of that watercolor. Again, stamp with purpose. And there we go. Perfect. Now, could you go in now and add little red dots? Yes, you could add berries with dimensional things. You could do whatever. You could ink your background. You could do all sorts of things to this if you want. But it's just really nice uh, to be able to just lay these one on top of the other because the whole idea about this overlay stamp set is it just gives you, uh, I don't know, just so many cool creative creative opportunities, right? To stamp a bunch of globes or stars or trees or pine cones. And they're great images by themselves, both sets, but I love the fact that they are designed to work together. So you could, you could essentially do that. If you wanted to emboss, say this, the top text, you just wanna make sure that this background is dried with a heat tool first, no matter what. Even if you're doing straight on stamping, you would stamp that, you would heat dry that base layer, and then you would stamp the top layer because archival is also uh, an embossable ink. But whenever you're using an ink that's, that's not embossing ink, quote unquote, right? That's not clear embossing ink, your open time, your time of wetness when you can use it is limited, right? You don't have 15 minute open time. Instead, you have just a, a few, really a few seconds in these. You know, these are gonna give you seconds. This might give you a minute, right? Now, when you're also doing your stamping, you could change it up, right? The cool thing about archival is you could change up like what colors you wanna stamp in, right? I use black soot. You could use ground espresso, vintage photo, hickory smoke, well, that'll be, that would be okay if maybe you were doing it over the snowflake and the snowflake was a really light blue and you wanted it to be a little bit more wintry. You know, a light blue, say tumbled glass or speckled egg might look really nice with hickory smoke over the top, right? But you could do any color of distress ink or archival. It's just really important if you, you know when it comes to stamping, especially when it comes to stamping in, in black, that I like a good black ink. You know, I love black soda and everybody has their favorites. I know there's so many different black inks on the market. And if you found your favorite, stick with it because you know that once you find a good, rich, crisp black ink, it is that that's everything. So I'm just going to show you like, cause I know a lot of people use Rangers jet black archival, which I have for years and I love it. I loved it. I still love it. Cause the archival formulation is the magic of Ranger, right? This is their, uh, proprietary formulation of, a, of an oil-based waterproof ink because archival you can stamp on any substrate, right? Fabric, wood, uh, plastic. It's okay on metal, uh, but not, not really my favorite. I kind of stick to those and of course paper. But Jet Black, which I've used for years, is it's a nice black ink. I mean, it really is. It's what I've used. But of course, when I did Distress and we had black soot, right? We know that black soot is really a very dark, dark, black ink. So being able to have black soot in archival, just, it changes everything for me. So that's why I like this particular, it doesn't make this one a bad black ink. If you're using it, it's a, it's a great ink. But when it came to layering colors in the world of distress, I was always going to use my black ink on something. Most of the time as stampers, you're stamping your black ink as a sentiment, or you're going to do some coloring, or you're doing whatever. I was always going to stamp it on something. Maybe it's a background, maybe it's another image. And so having an, an ink that's, that's much darker and doesn't have any like blue or purple is just what I wanted. But again, you need to do, do what works for, for you, right? All right, so let's move on. Let's keep, keep everything going, I'm reading everything. Thanks, you guys are awesome. I'm reading your comments too, super nice. So many ideas, right? And this is just like, Again, I'm only scratching the surface. Like I need to just stick and do a few little things and that's it. It is a, it's a big visual difference. Um, 
So on the, on the archivals, so the distress archivals, the difference between distress archival and, and the other archivals really is just the palette, right? So when you see archival, that's the formulation. This is just the branding for the color. So this is that formulation in these colors. So these are the distressed colors, right? So hickory smoke, ground espresso, it's very limited. We don't have uh, the full palette of archival. Now the colors come in minis. The only thing that come in what I call the regulation size pads, and this would be after years of, and anyone that's followed the, the, whole, the whole drama, I won't say it's drama, because it wasn't drama. The saga. The saga. the saga, there you go. Is that for years I wanted this ink in a regulation size ink pad. The ones that I stamp with the most, right? I'll use these for small little accents, but like for stamping, sentiments and all that, these four colors were my jam. And, and several years ago, they, they gave the designers like a, what they called a, I think it was a mixed media palette. It was a big ink pad that had four different pads built into it in archival, but it's a very hard ink pad to work with. So uh, it was this year actually, yeah. hard to believe, right? Took, I mean, however many years, uh, but in June. So the archival stack, these are only sold in, in a stack. Um, but I think there are some retailers that have purchased it and sell individually. So good on them and good on you that you get to pick. But Ranger sells them uh, as a set. They also have re for these because of course it's the same that's in the minis. But it is nice that now I have uh, the colors that I normally stamp with in that regulation size. And they stamp great. I mean, they stamp great on, this is watercolor cardstock. And then that's a coated cardstock. Obviously coated is really going to show up uh, way more detail, but there's still a great stamp for, for watercolor paper because it's oil-based. It doesn't, it doesn't wick out like a traditional dye ink does. So, all right, moving on. A lot of info packed in, just kind of reading the chat. Uh, someone already asked, can you get rinkers? Yes, you get rinkers for all of, all of Distress inks for the ink pads, the oxides, the archivals. So they have that because if they had it for the mini, they have it for the big. Okay. How are we doing, Mario? Doing great. Not bad? Yeah, how are you doing? Good. I'm happy your camera's working. There is that. <laughs> I've got stuff everywhere. Uh, listen, I'm like off camera trying to move stacks because I look at my table and see. As soon as I do, I'm going to want it. So that's probably not good. Okay. okay. Let's do some prep work. How about that? Let's do a little prep and then we'll get back into the demo because we're going to do some prep with, with texture paste because I just want to share some cool things with stencils. Uh, you may have seen this before, but you also may have just forgotten about it. And this is the time of year that you have to pull out all those tricks that you, you can to just wow the world with, with all that you do, all your creative juju. So let's go in, I'm gonna do a, I'm just gonna go into my backgrounds, all right? There's that brick one that we did last time. I do like a lot of these backgrounds. This is a cool, I love, I think this would be a good background, but maybe I wanna try something a little bit more. Ooh, that's pretty. Mm. Okay, maybe I'll try that one. Maybe I'll do two of them. I'll do this one too. Look at that. That was that green with the mica and the oxide. I, think, I don't know when we did that one. Maybe we did that in week one, right? Remember, if you have a tin that you can keep your backgrounds in that you can cut up, it's so much easier to get and use and cut them up, right? I normally work in this size, but remember with that trimmer, you just chop them in half. And this is just one of the distressed storage tins, a great way to, to keep your stuff in there. Okay. So we're just going to take these and we're going to do a little bit of stenciling to this. Okay. So let's, I'm just going to take a piece of sticky grid. Okay. So sticky grid, this is just a smaller size for the sidekick, but sticky grid also comes uh, in this. This is like to me way more cost effective, right? Because you get bigger sheets and you can just cut these up to whatever you need. But uh, this is here. So I'm just going to use it. All right, just gonna take this. We talk, we've talked about Sticky Grid for years, so there you go. Sticky Grid is your friend. It is. I mean, it definitely has some drawbacks, I'm not gonna lie. It's because it's meant for die cutting, so I get that. Um, but I, I make it work, okay? So for die cutting, it, it has no drawbacks, but for what I do, it's like there's some things that I like for it to do and some things I wish it didn't. Okay, so I've got this down, and then I'm going to take a stencil Take just a piece of masking tape because that's how I like to use my stencils. I like to be able to see what's going on. I, w I like the ability to, to kind of do the little peekaboo and put it back down if I choose. Okay, we're going to work with texture paste. We're going to do matte and we're going to work with some embossing powder. Use whatever embossing powder you want. For this one, I'm going to just do metallic. Then we're going to do a palette knife. Use whatever palette knife you want to work with. These are my go-tos. These are Distress, right? These guys right here. They're in a nice fancy little bag, but um, 
these are really the two I like. I like the one that I, if I'm doing flat for like glue or gesso, and I like this little guy for my paste because it has that really nice uh, trowel edge, but it's like a little sports car. It can get into to tight corners. So I'm gonna take my paste. That's my new jar of paste, All right? Normally I would have a little press and seal on there, but I will after the demo because this is a fresh one. I'm gonna just pick up some paste on the bottom of my palette knife. That's the best way we're going to do this. And I'm just gonna apply kind of haphazard on this particular stencil. I'm just gonna push through. You can do this with any kind, but what I like about this technique is it allows you to transform a background for, uh, for really anything. It could be holiday cards, it could be anything. So what I'm doing, you can see I didn't use a lot of paste, right? I'm pressing it in, but I'm also using that straight edge to kind of gently scrape it off. If you can't see your stencil, you have too much medium. Right? So if you frosted this like a cake and then you go to lift it off because you can't see the stencil design, all of that stuff is going to come up through the stencil and then collapse underneath. So we don't want to do that. All right? So we're just going to flip this up. Ooh, look at that. That's nice. Okay. We'll lift this piece up. There's our paste. And while our paste is wet, we're going to take some embossing powder and we're going to cover it with embossing powder. And be generous, right? Your paste, although the paste uh, it takes a while to dry. It might take anywhere from 10 to 15 minutes, depending on where you live. Um, it forms a skin like pudding fairly quickly. So this isn't something that you would want to paste 10 things and then powder them. You want to paste and powder as you go. But once you have the powder on there, you can see that it's stuck to the paste. You're going to set this aside to dry. So this is one of those things that we're going to do a little prep and we'll come back to it uh, later. So I'm going to set this right over here on this table. This way I can find it. Okay, we'll come back to it. But then I'm gonna put this back, place that down, get this. I've got that already set. We'll take my next background because, well, why not do a couple if I'm doing it? Again, probably only uh, finish one, but, and this could be really any color, and you could do the entire background if you want. But when I look at stencils, I always think of stencils as just some type of creative opportunity. Some people use it as a full background, and that is fine. So we're just going to scrape that paste back in the jar. Normally I would put my, my press and seal on that. I'm going to lift this off. It's all about the dismount. You want to lift that straight up. There we go. Nice texture. I love how crisp it is. Again, the palette knife allows me just to go in and put that just where I want it to be. Add some embossing. This could be any color. I'm using gold, but you can use, this would have been beautiful and liquid platinum, but I didn't. So don't get, don't get carried away in the color options. I love the breaks of that, right? That's what I wanted to create for this. I'm gonna let this one dry. The reason we let it dry is because we are going to need to heat emboss it. We're gonna to need to go in and do heat embossing. But if you heat emboss paste while the paste is wet, it's going to puff up like marshmallow and that white usually pops through the embossing, which is not what we wanna do. Sometimes I've done it, but this is not what I wanna do. So to clean my stencil, I'm just gonna take it and I'm going to place it in water. I've got a little tray right here off camera. We refer to it as the lasagna pan for years, although it never had lasagna in it, but right. That's what we did. So just going to pick up that little paste with my finger, clean that off. Mario's like, never, they would never. Okay. So we're going to let those dry. We're going to talk about the next one, right? We're going to go into the next one because that one is also going to dry. You can see, uh, I got my little present seal. This time we're going to use texture paste, but crackle. It's the same idea, but it's a very cool way that we can add a texture to a background uh, and get it to crack. And again, this is something that um, I learned from Stacy. I saw we were, I shared this technique using paste and powder, uh, but I never thought of using crackle. And I saw this, this tutorial uh, she did on a blog. I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't believe it works. It's, it's amazing. So what we're going to do is we're going to work with texture paste as our foundation, right? but crackle, because we actually, let's get it to focus. There we go, because we want this one to crack, but you could use it with regular matte texture paste that I showed before. But what we're going to use instead of gold embossing powder or metallic, is we're going to work with embossing glazes. If you haven't played with these, if you don't have these out, you definitely want to get them out because they are a blast to play with. They're just not your traditional uh, types of embossing powders. Glazes, this is an old swatch. It doesn't have the new Kitsch Flamingo or Salvage Patina. Uh, but what these are, these are translucent powders. So when they melt, you can see through to your background. And it, it offers up some really cool ways to create some effects on your background, okay? This is regular embossing powder. So you can see they both have a shine. 
but normally, and I'm not saying that all embossing powders like this, there are translucent embossing powders in, in the industry. So it's, this is not like I revolutionize anything, but this series is only translucent. So you don't have to guess, well, is this translucent or matte? We've all been there where we, you know, you get an embossing powder like a red and you go to emboss it on a dark piece of paper and it, it vanishes. You're like, what's going on? Most embossing powders are gonna be opaque though. So you can see when you put those on, they emboss with a nice, bold, vivid color. I love the fact that a glaze is going to be just that. It's gonna give me that wonderful translucency that is going to showcase on my background. And this could be done on an inked background like I've done here, or for the sake of this demo, I'm just gonna do some craft. This is just a little bit of, of heavy stock craft, okay? So let's go in and take a stencil. Now for this, we could get as creative as we want, right? We can go simple where we're just gonna do a bunch of trees in different colors, or we can get ultra fancy and do something that has a lot of colors. Well, you know where I'm going. I'm just gonna go fancy, right? Why not? So I'm gonna take my stencil and I'm gonna place it off the edge because if this is, let's just say it's gonna be a card front, probably won't be because I'll chop it up, um, but I would just bleed it off the edge and then I'm going to feather out the paste. So you'll see what I'm, talking about in a second Whoop. Oh, position it and then move it there we go okay so before we start before we put on the paste let's pick our palette let's pick what we want to do well I know that there's some some pine in here so I'm going to do some green so let's do ooh, let's do a little rustic wilderness and let's do some peeled paint I always like to mix my colors so I'll do two greens then we've got some berries so definitely use some kitsch because we have some red we use a little fired brick. This is definitely dark, so I think the kitsch is gonna add a little brightness. It looks like we got some pine cones, so let's do some browns. Could you just do this with, with one color? Sure, could you do this technique with uh, just texture paste, right? Just, I'm sorry, just texture paste in one color, like green? Yeah, you could just use green, that's fine. I just wanna show that you could also mix up your, your color palette. These. Same tin, storage tin, it does a lot of things. Crayons, it's sometimes, we used to call it the crayon tin, but then I used it for everything else and now it's just a storage tin. But it holds crayons, it holds glazes, it holds jars of stuff, it holds backgrounds. So just so you know, that's the one that we're going to use. All right, texture paste crackle, here we go. Pick this up so you can see, right? As I use my press and seal, you push it down as you use it, it's, it's not just designed to go as a top layer. Some people, when they put it on, they just think, oh, I've covered it, that's good. But what you did is you essentially trapped air in your jar of stuff. That's what we're trying to avoid. Air in a jar is what makes a medium dry up and go away. So when I, as I use this, and maybe you have to get a new piece, you know, as you use it, you need something bigger, but you try to press it in there and seal it around onto your medium because that's what's going to allow your medium to remain fresh. fresh. There we go. So okay. So I'm just going to go in and pick up some of this nice creaminess. Creamy dreamy. Okay. So I'm going to pick some up with my palette knife and I'm going to apply this. Oh, one, one more thing. Sorry. Got a little distracted. Now that I have my colors, I want to get them set up. So I'm going to, I'm going to kind of do that over here off camera, but they're going to be here. So I'm going to have both of my I need to sort. I'm going to have both of my browns open. You'll see, I'll bring them in frame when I go to actually use them. But you want to have these open at the ready. This is all about timing, because remember I talked to you about that little skin-like pudding? But this is an easy, easy repetition. Seriously, you can do this technique on so many backgrounds simultaneously. You can get yourself in a groove, because once you have the, the powder on your background, it doesn't matter when you go back and emboss it. As long as you don't touch it before then, it doesn't really matter. All right, so I'm going to pick up some of this. See, a nice little cream. And I'm going to just put this through my stencil. Again, spread that on there. Just gonna kind of go down as if, as if this were a card front, but same rules apply. You wanna push it down, see that? And then skim it off. So that's kind of the motion that I'm doing. Sometimes I don't talk about it because it's just such a natural motion. So you're not just spreading it on, you're pushing through the stencil and then skimming it off and go in different directions because sometimes the stencils you know, have different cut directions and you may not get that uh, where you want it. But I like the fact that it's just going to, to kind of bleed off, if you will, right? So once that's done, we'll scrape that. I'm gonna put that in the water, open this up, push that in there. I'll do all my tidy seal up a little later because now the clock is ticking. So I'm gonna lift this off 
Excellent. This I'm going to put in water. Excellent. There we go. And I'm going to pick up my paper. Just going to move this out of here so the paper doesn't stick to it. So now I've got my just a piece of scrap paper for my embossing powders. So all we're going to do is just take our powders, take our fingers, pinch the powder and twist your fingers together. You're just twisting them together. And by doing that, you're letting a little bit of that powder fall. And this is something you need to do right away. And I'm, I'm pretty much trying to focus that color where I want it, right? So in this case, I'm doing a little bit of green over the, those pine areas, but you don't need to cover everything completely. You'll see why in just a second. Might be more than a second, but you'll get the idea. So now I'm going in with my second layer of green, just twisting. You don't really want to have too much powder on there. So when you're done, you can put the excess back. Be sure to wipe your fingers off, you know, your shirt, whatever. All right, now we're going in with a little bit of pink. It is challenging when you have big fingers. And if you had fingernails, wow, that's really a challenge. I've seen some people use like, you know, little spoons or sometimes they'll use the end of a, like a, a popsicle stick or whatever's gonna work for you. But we're just gonna put that again, another little pinch. Ooh, so this one I need to angle because my, my little fingers don't fit in that jar right now. There we go. So next I'm just gonna add just a touch of red. Same thing, going over those berries. This is one, I just wanna share this background because sometimes people, you know, you don't wanna take it to this level, but you can. You could just do one or two colors of a background, like I mentioned on the trees. But it's really fun to, to do it like this. All right, so next I'm gonna take a little vintage photo. We're gonna go over that pine cone, hit that first. And normally I'll start with the color that I want to be, let's just say the dominant color, right? What do I wanna see more of? Because while you have that entire surface exposed, you have a pretty good chance of most of it being uh, kind of attracted to that first color that you use. But again, you do you. So now I'm gonna look at it. For the most part, it's good, but I can see some areas that are just completely white where Obviously, the first time I just missed it, I didn't see it. So like on this pine, I'm gonna go back. I don't need it to be completely covered, but if there's nothing even in the neighborhood, that's gonna be a problem, okay? Because you're not gonna be able to get stuff that far uh, transferred. Okay, so once we have it on there, next you're gonna do the dance. I'm gonna have my fingers underneath this card. I'm gonna hold onto the card and I'm just gonna do a little tap dance with my fingers underneath and you're gonna see what happens to the powder. You ready? Normally I would do this way closer to the paper, but I want you to see what's happening. So here we go. Okay. And I just kind of angle the paper. There we go. So what happens is that color is transferred around, right? We get that nice little, little dance of color, if you will. If you picked it up and you just tipped it, if you had a heavy color here, it's gonna fall. Now, this pine still didn't take much. My paste may be dry, and if it is, no worries, because we're still gonna add some color to this when it's done. But I, I can go back to another area. There's nothing wrong that if you, if you look at this and you see that you didn't get color where you want, you could always try to go back. But same rules, we're just gonna do a little dance and see if we got more to stick. We got a little bit more to stick there, not a whole lot, but that's it. If we pick this up, as I was mentioning, and just tap it down, whatever color's here, you could risk just mudding your whole thing. So do the tap dance. What do you do with this? Well, it's a party mix. Me personally, I throw it away. Some people just use it, but really what it's gonna melt down to is sludge. But if you're looking for brown, you pretty much made it. So, hey, that could be something where you just save, it's gonna be your jar of brown. But yes, there is no way to sort this back out. This right here, right? Normally I would have had Hey, thanks, Mario. Thanks. Normally I would have had, um, I would have been closer to the paper, so I wouldn't have, I'm gonna set this aside to dry. I wouldn't have powder everywhere like I do now, but if you ever get powder, it seems like this is like a, an infomercial for like, I don't know, uh, yeah, I don't know what company makes, well, Preston Seal and Swiffer, maybe it's the same, but um, I don't no, know. No, it is, I think it is. Oh, is it? Well, there you yeah. go. Um, but I just, I use a Swiffer to get glitter or embossing powder off of my media mat. I do that because it's static charged and usually when I just go in with a cloth, it just doesn't work. So there you go. So I just have one of those on a little stand because I can't touch them. They feel nasty to me. Okay, let me press that in. There we go. So we're gonna let that dry. Could you have done that same coloring with powder technique on just regular paste? Yes. Translucent paste? Yes. Crackle paste? Yes. 
any other kind of paste that you want to use, you definitely can. I just wanted to show that the crackle paste is very cool and it will crack even with the glaze, right? All right, just going to put the lids on these. There we go. There we go. And there we go. So next, we're going to let all that stuff dry. We're going to move on to uh, some other techniques and then we're going to come back. Okay. I think that's just the best as the best way, best way to be. Let's get on to some inking. That was cool. See, it's a little prep work just for the sake of the demo, because I, you know, I could have pre pasted everything, but then you really don't see how it's done. And that kind of annoys me when you can't really see how it's done. Okay. So next let's do, oh, this is a good one. See, I don't know what I'm going to do until I look back at the table and I see what I set up and then it's like, oh, that's what we're going to do. Okay. This is a favorite. This is a duh. It's a favorite of mine. It's not a favorite of everybody. I'll give you that. Some people just find this technique absolutely annoying. It's called smudge stamping. Uh, smudge stamping is just a fun technique to do for the holidays when you just don't have the creative juju to do it, or you just want to make a bunch of things, or maybe you have people over, maybe you have grandkids or friends, family, and they're like, oh, let's do something crafty. You're a crafty person. And you know what I mean, that you probably don't want to show them what you normally do. So this is a great way to just share a fun technique that anyone can do. You're going to work with, well, essentially whatever it is you want to work with. You can work with any kind of paper. I will say that if a paper has a little bit more of a, a coating, if you will, like this is mixed media, this is, this has a little bit more of a coating for wet that you're going to get more smudge, but you could do this on watercolor paper. You can do this on the white heavy stock. I'm just going to do this on mixed media because well, it's just easier for me. Okay. You're going to take a clean blending tool. It could be a flat foam or domed foam. Either one. I prefer domed foam for, for this particular one. You could have this if you wanted to, you could have this one stuck down, but it doesn't really matter for this. You could use any kind of uh, stamping apparatus, but essentially what we're going to do is we're going to stamp in an ink and we're going to smudge it. Now you can do this technique with oxide as well as regular distress ink. Um, it does not work with archival. Archival is going to dry too fast and you're not going to have any, any smudgeness. Okay. But you can definitely do this with uh, your distress inks or oxide. You'll get a different level of smudge depending on which kind of ink that you use. Okay. All right. Let me take these. So we'll start with just, we'll start with some, some boldness. So essentially the idea is this, you take a stamp. Okay. And you take an ink pad. In this case, let's do a little fire brick and you ink it up and you ink with purpose, right? And what I mean by that is you don't want to just lightly put ink on a stamp like that. You want to ink with purpose. And that means tap, 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 because we want to have a nice coverage of this. Then when you go and stamp, we want to stamp and smudge. Okay. So for this, if we wanted to take this and go straight across, we're just going to stamp, give it some pressure lift it off, take the tool, circular motion, smudge. Okay. Just a clean foam. It's not wet. It's nothing. And all that's going to do is just give you a little smudge coloring. It doesn't do anything, right? It doesn't change anything. It doesn't make it run off the page. You're always going to get your image when you stamp it. This is just going to take that ink and create a halo. Pretty simple. So when I'm done, wipe that off. Pick another stamp. Okay, where's this? Let's find a little border block. Here we got this one. Okay. We can do this one in oxide just so you can see the difference. Because you can do both, right? You don't have to you don't have to commit to one one ink or the other. What do I have over here? Oh, let's do I do love a good peeled paint, I'm not gonna lie. All right. So this stamp, let's just place it down, get it relaxed. Okay. And same foam. It doesn't matter because the foam is going on the paper, not the pad. So you don't have to change your foam if you're smudging uh, ink or oxide. It doesn't really matter. So I've inked it up. Nice. Let's go along this edge. Perfect. Stamp. Just run your fingers, lift it off. Tool. Smudge. Okay. Circular motion and I'm smudging. I mean, I'm not like, I'm going in. You can kind of see my, even my fingertips change colors because I'm smudging. That's the effect. Now, what you're going to notice is you're going to get more smudginess out of an oxide because the pigment is what is going to stay wet and allow you to smudge. The dye is going to absorb quicker. 
whereas this it's a it's more of a faint smudge because this is all dye so again you can you can mix and match or you can just stick to one or the other really really simple to do okay clean this off i'm just using a dry towel for this and you just repeat you just go for it and you could do i mean i like this because it's a it's a great way that we can take any type of collage stamps that we don't want to do or just not even think about this and play around with different papers because i will tell you that different papers are going to give you uh, different smudge results right i've even tried this on coated paper like specialty stamping and that gave me a a great result as well let's take some walnut okay ink 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 the importance of this a couple things one you want to make sure you have enough ink two don't hang out on your paper okay and what i mean by that is that if you're going to do smudge stamping if you sit there and hold that ink into your paper, all that colorant is going to absorb into the paper and you're not going to have anything to smudge, right? So that just means like press, stamp, lift, smudge. Okay. Don't hesitate. Don't think about it. Don't see, you know, do you want to go clockwise? Kind of, it doesn't matter, right? Look at that, all that. See these little splashes? That's just me, probably me spitting when I'm talking, but that's, just, that's, that's the reactive part. But your smudge is very, very smooth when you're working. Could you stamp and smudge again? Not for this technique, because you're not gonna have enough ink to get a nice smudge, but same tool, right? I use the same uh, dirty tool, right? Because you're, you're not transferring the color. Like you saw that green was green. It didn't, didn't have a lot. It just depends. If you, if you wanna use different tools, like some people I know smudge stamp, with their ink blending tool. So let's say when they're smudging red, they would take a red ink blending tool without putting ink on it because then you get like a little bit of that red residue and you get a, a stronger smudge. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. I mean, that, that's actually pretty cool if you wanted to create that. So let's take this one. We'll do this guy. Let's pick him. Let's see what I have over here for, ah, that's a good color. A little evergreen bow in oxide. That's kind of fun. I take this and you can also see you know when it comes to this particular collage i didn't even put that stamp on the block straight doesn't matter because i'm just going to decide what i want to do i think for this i'll maybe i'll finish this border over here mm, i think so yeah let's go for it stamp lift smudge all right you want to get a little bonus color you see that pick that off smudge you want some extra color take it right off of your stamp and get a little bit more smudgeness. See, so there's a lot of ways that we can go in and add more smudge color if you're not getting as much as you wanted. You can take it off of the stamp, what's left, you can pick it off of there. Just really a lot of different options for this technique. All right, and the idea is that you would just continue, continue, continue. Um, I think I'll just do one more smudge in the background with that little text right there. For this, I'll take something light so maybe we'll go in and do a little bit of, I don't know if I want to use pumice stone. I think I'll do some, let's do some speckled egg. That might be too light. I'll do ice spruce. It's here. It's a favorite. So I saw okay. a question a couple yeah, of times. Yeah, go for it. Why doesn't the text smudge? Because the ink is attracted to the surface, right? So as soon as you stamp it, our ink goes right into that paper. This, all your smudging, is what's sitting on the paper before it's all absorbed. Mm, that was a good choice. A little ice spruce. So that's why. Because, see, so many people think when they stamp, like, you know, they stamp paper and they just hold it because they're like, oh, don't touch it. It's still going to be really wet. Unless you're stamping on glass, which you shouldn't with distress. It doesn't stay, by the way. Um, you're not going to get that. Porous paper, it's designed to grab onto stuff. And, and in fact, you know, what a lot of people don't realize is different papers, regardless of their their finish um, are quite surprising, right? I'll, let me just see if I can just grab one off to the side. Uh, that's, oh, here we go. Here's one. So this is alcohol ink cardstock, right? This is, this is glossy cardstock, if you will. It's, it's Rangers alcohol ink cardstock, so it's glossy on the front, matte on the back. So glossy paper, let's just take that. Let's clean that up. We'll go back to, go back to the first one, just because I think seeing it with a, a real bold color you'll get the idea, right? I'm gonna go back to fired bricks. We're gonna do the same thing with that special delivery. I'm gonna work on the glossy side of this, inking it up with my same distress. Okay. 
We'll go in and we're going to stamp on glossy. Mm, look at that. Whoop, whoop. Nice. Okay. And so take so this. Much, think it's new, new to a lot of people. Okay. So even on glossy, that's why I wanted to share it with you. Because all paper is porous, regardless of its surface, it's porous. It's paper. <laughs> paper is designed to absorb. The, the treatment to that paper is what allows a lot of different techniques. We refer to it as open time, right? So glossy paper, because of its coating, allows the alcohol ink to, to work its way out. But it's still porous. It's very different than Yupo, which is synthetic and it's plastic and it's not porous. So understanding porous and non-porous, it still opens up some great, because you can see every bit of detail, but because this is coated, more coated than this tag, it gave me more open time to smudge the ink that didn't absorb into the paper yet, right? So if you would have stamped in distress, for example, and you dried it with a heat tool, you wouldn't get any of it to smudge because the paper would be absorbed, right? That's the difference. So, so playing around with stuff, that's why I say as a maker, if you aren't, I mean, I would say that probably next to ink, I am a paper connoisseur. I am always looking for the next coolest paper. And I don't say the next best because there isn't a paper that is the best in my opinion because different papers do different things. And you could have the same exact technique in this case and do it on two different kinds of papers and get a completely different result. That's the cool part of it. That's the fun of taking your products to a whole nother level just by changing the paper, right? So kind of getting over that fear factor of thinking that paper uh, and using ink, like you always have to work in permanent inks. I don't use a lot of permanent inks. I stamp with archival when I want that thing to not go anywhere, which is usually well, this layer, like a, a finished thing, like maybe I want to have a, a sentiment or something, or maybe we want to do, maybe we want to do Santa's face, right? Let's do him, All right? We're going to, we'll put him down and I want him to, to just be there, right? I want him to, I want to stamp with purpose. Before I do that, let me just go in and fill in the blanks because that's going to kind of drive me a little crazy to not have, not have this filled in. So let's take a little vintage photo, right? I'm just going to smear some of this down because I have color, remember? I'm, I'm just gonna use the same dirty, I have my ink tools, but I'm not gonna go get them. But I'm using the same dirty one, so I don't wanna go into my ink pad. Remember I told you, you don't wanna do that. But I can take my inks and just put them onto my mat, and that can just become my ink pad, right? So now I can just go in and just add a little, little brown happy for me, right? Just going in, just using, using the ink from that glass, because it's not gonna dry. But this way I'm able to even mix some colors. So sometimes maybe you don't have a full palette of color. A great way to mix is to do it right there on the glass because the glass, unlike this, this is gonna have drag. So if you try to apply your inks to a craft mat to do this, your inks are gonna have drag to them. But glass, nothing sticks to the glass. So you're able to pick up all those colors. So I just kind of made my little combo of vintage photo and walnut stain. So if you look at my tag, you kind of see a little bit of both, right? You get that little warmth from vintage photo wherever I swooped it. Then you get a little darker for walnut stain. It's kind of fun, all right? I like that, a little vintage happy. And then, still before I stamp, I'm just gonna go in with my water and let's just do a little flick. So now I'm taking my sprayer and I'm, instead of misting it, right, like we did before, I'm slowly squeezing this. See that little spit? That's what's cool about the sprayer. And that's putting drips on here. Let them sit for just a minute. Or if you wanna have a nice outline, Give it a few seconds with a heat tool, paper towel, absorb, dismount. Then you have a whole different look, right? Very cool, very effective watermark by doing that. So what made it so dramatic, okay? What made it dramatic are water, heat, heat, just even a few seconds of heat creates an outline. So just by adding that, because as soon as water hit this ink, that distress was like, I'm out of here, I'm out of here. It wants to get out of the way. That's its wicking properties. A few seconds with the heat tool makes that little barrier stop. And then by taking a paper towel, you can see it, if you, if you look at the paper towel, that absorbs the color, it lifts it out versus taking a cloth and doing this. Doing that, you're actually like pressing and smushing water in different places, which you might like that look. But that's what creates that kind of cool, uh, dramatic effect, if you will. And the same thing would work on glossy. Let's do that. Let's put some water on there, right? Wait a second. Ink's going, oh, I got to get out of here. I got to get out of here. A few seconds because I want to outline. 
paper towel, dismount, look at that, right? Because it's always going to be reactive with water. Cool, that looks like snow, right? So even if you didn't use stamps, imagine just doing glossy cardstock with your distress inks and oxides and flicking some water. Beautiful winter background. Yeah, coated papers are fun. There's, I could just go on and on really for, for hours, guys, just about one technique on every paper. We could spend an hour on one technique in every paper. Okay, so now I wanna stamp this guy. Well, anytime I've done some type of water, I just wanna dry it with a heat tool. I'm a chronic heat tool user. Ask Diane, ask Dina, they give me, they give me guff about it all the time because, well, I just wanna make sure things are dry. That's why I love a heat it tool because I make sure that my paper's dry, but now I want to stamp my image. And my image is going to be stamped with purpose. I want to make sure that it's there. So oh, let's go back to this guy. All right. Now, back in the day, before there was a stamping tool, right, you would just hope for the best. But now that any kind of stamping tool exists, why would you do that, right? Now I'm, I'm going to be able to, to go in and make sure that I have it. So I'm going to position this guy I'll position little prize fighters in their corners. Call them prize fighters. Keep them away from each other. They like to fight. I want that to happen. We're going to place that down. All right, we'll pick this up. Excellent. I want to make sure that this is going to be the image. So I'm going to go to archival just because I know that the archival is going to give me just the, the best look. Where's my little, I'm going to say, where's my cover this way? It'll stay quieter. Normally I put like the little cover under there, but all right, tap, 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 all right? Ink with purpose, change, position. I'm just trying to do this on camera. Normally I'd even take off the plate to do it. Okay, ink, great, position, go in there, stamp. And there's a lot of little tools. Some people, you know, don't have good hand pressure. They have all little like air hockey puck kind of things you could do now, but just stamp. Don't, still don't do CPR. That's not good. You're gonna flatten out the rubber, right? But some pressure is not gonna be bad. Then we're gonna lift, look at that, prize fighters back into their corners, All right? Don't lift them off because they're gonna come together. You're gonna be stuck in the middle. And there we go, look at that. Fun, 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 because you're not thinking about it. It's very collage -y. you're not thinking, well, how do you get ink off of this? Archival ink, archival cleaner, right? Waterproof, will that clean with water? No, waterproof. So you need a cleaner for that. Maybe you're gonna use glass cleaner or something. I just use archival, just, it's got a quick little, Dabbery do on the top. And we'll just clean that off. Why? Because you should. All right. Then this. All right. Quick little wipe of that. Peel that off. Put that in. Done. Okay. Nice, right? Fun. And we could go on and on with this. Let's face it. We could we could do mica stain. We could do a million and one things onto this, but it's a very cool effect to just take your stamps and play around with it. And this will also really, I mean, I think this is a great exercise for those of you that just freak your freak over a stamp, right? That you want your stamps to be pristine and perfect and you want every image to be T squared and you know, you go through 10 to get one. This is a great technique just to go for it because they're all gonna look good. And let's just say this was a hot mess. Remember this, you have the ability to crop. So if things went a little wonky, you could always go in and cut this and crop this down. Like this guy, he's a great card front, right? I'm not gonna keep him as a tag. I just happen to know that this paper was this tag. So I'll chop it off and he's gonna make a very cool card front, but a lot of fun. You could add so many other details to this. It's just a fun way to create a background using stamps and smudging. And it just, yeah, it gets over that fear factor very quick. Okay, moving on. Next from smudge stamping, we're going to do another messy technique. Uh, with ink, but instead of smudging, we're just gonna wet it out. Now, we already talked about that in, in the first tag where we did the watercolor. Now we're gonna focus specifically on that technique. As you saw before with that holly, when I sprayed it with water, you can create watercolor with any kind of stamp. But sometimes I design stamps specifically for a technique, okay? In this case, it happens to be watercolor. And what makes this image specific for a technique is you can look at the art and see that it's got a lot of surface. Right? So if you look at, say, this holly compared to the holly that I did, see, I don't want to confuse anyone. Let's go back to, uh, where's that tag? I don't know where, I don't know what I did with it already, Mario. What are you looking for? Are there are little tags that I just stamped earlier. 
Not those over there. I don't know where I put them, guys. But I was trying to go back just to... Oh, here, here, they're over here. Yeah. Here we go. Back in business. Okay. This one is what I'm talking about. So remember that this one was a very detailed stamp. Okay. Let's go back to that image so you can see. See the openness? Now, did it work? Sure, it worked. But you also see that there are some open areas. And when you have less ink, there's even more open areas because of how the stamp is designed. So if, if I really think that a technique is going to look great for a type of image, especially for watercolor, I create more bold designs, but still give them a wispy look. So this is art that I licensed. That was actually watercolor. We took a watercolor, extracted this, and took those watercolor designs because that's what gives it that such a, an organic movement. And then we adjusted the contrast just so you have nice, solid surface. Okay. So these are two different sets. This was winter watercolor. This is CMS 354. This one I did, um, I think a few years back. It's still available. It's, it's awesome because it's very small. You can create a wreath with things because a lot of these have little turns. So you can do a wreath, you can do corners. So cool. But this year I wanted to just take some of the images, not all of them, but like this one, I really liked. I thought this was a cool image. And so I made it bigger, right? But then I put some new images in. I put a tree. We didn't have that tree. I did a longer holly branch. So just kind of mix it up. I love the idea of this kind of fern slash juniper. I love this berry stem. Again, uh, Stacy did a tutorial on her blog. I just, it's like a shout out to Stacy Day. Uh, but she did a tutorial on this uh, as well. But there's so many different ways that, that you can use this stamp set. In fact, if you go onto the Stampers Anonymous Christmas blog post, check out all the cards that the makers did. And really, you should be watching them because so many makers are sharing all the stuff they did uh, earlier in the year. So you definitely want to check it out. But this is Winter Watercolor 2, right? So it's pretty much one and two. I love them both because, as you can see, the scale is different but you can use both together. This one has a poinsettia, this one has a tree, there's smaller elements. Very, very cool to, to create and work with, with this. And I love, having, I love having a set, I do, matchy matchy. So what can we do for watercolor? Well, as you saw with the first one, you can use oxide or ink or both. So let's do that. Because I'm gonna deal with watercolor, I'm gonna work on watercolor cardstock. Now, you can use the smooth side or the textured side, whichever you wanna do. Because I'm stamping, I'm going to choose the smooth side. Again, that's just by choice. So let's say I'm going to go in and do, oh, I don't know. I'll do this holly. Why not? I'm in the, I'm in the mood for holly. Okay, we'll take this. Now you can see that all of my stamps are primed. Right? I've talked about this before when we talk about priming. Um, I always prime my stamps with archival. I just take archival, just black. I lightly rub the stamp, all, like the whole set, as soon as I get it. You'll see that I just wipe that on there, let it dry for just a minute, take a dry cloth, and I wipe my stamps. I find that by doing this, by putting archival on them, it keeps those stamps um, like ready to take ink. Sometimes a brand new stamp, a brand new clear stamp, or a brand new rubber stamp, uh, when you try to put ink on it, the ink beads up. If you, if you notice that happen, don't sand your stamps. I don't care who tells you that. Like, don't sand a stamp. Not with sandpaper, steel wool, emery board. They're not meant to be sanded just put some ink on there then you can clean it off so you can see here this one was primed but obviously i've cleaned it right, stamp cleaner and it, it won't stay black if you didn't want it to i'm just not bothered because i know that archival is waterproof so any ink that i put on is not going to re-wet okay but if it bothered you really you could go in with your stamp cleaner i'll even show you why talk talk is cheap holtz here we go archival cleaner oh my gosh that's the first i know this actually pains me to do it, but I'll just for the sake of showing you. So archival cleaner, I just dab some on there. So you can see it's on there. See it? Take my cloth, clean that off. There we go. And you could keep going and you could get it as clean as you want. Whenever I use cleaner though on my stamps, I always go in with a little bit of water, like wash and rinse, right? Even though Diane doesn't do that to the dishes, she likes, <laughs> I think this is maybe what even started it. Yeah, wash and rinse like the dishes. And she's like, I don't rinse the dishes. That was a whole other debate. But I like to clean it off with water because I am not a fan of stamp cleaner um, to stay on my stamps because it contains a conditioner. And that conditioner is almost like a, it's a glycerin, like an oil. And that remains on your stamp. And then when you try to ink it, it doesn't ink. And you're like, but I cleaned it. Well, yeah, that's the problem. So anyway, that's kind of the happy medium. Rinse it with water. All right, let's go in. I'm just going to take my inks 
and I'll use my different Distress Ink minis. I'm just going with some colors. So I'm just starting with green. I'm using the corner of that. Just picking up some different colors. A little forest moss. Okay. And just using the corner again. I've, I talked about this earlier. You're not going to contaminate your inks this way. And I started with green intentionally because I'll still go with pink, even though pink on green. And I'm just using the corner of the pad. It's okay if you get a little color and I'll show you uh, where I got like some pink in there. It doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. I'll take a little candied apple. It's throwing a little bit of red. Just not much. And then I will take some brown because let's take a little gathered twigs. We haven't used that one. So now I'm going to try to go in and get this little stem without making the berries brown. But if I get a little bit there, that's okay. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. So now I look, I still have can you see I've got ink pretty much everywhere, but you see that little blank spot right there? Yeah, you could leave it. I'm not because you have the technology, you have inks right there. So just go in and fill in the blank. Okay. So once you have that, we're going to do watercolor. Remember we said before, water, color. Could you just stamp this? Yes, you can see the ink is wet, you can stamp it and you're, you're good to go. Because even though it's a watercolor stamp, you can still stamp just by itself but by adding some water right you can see the water see the droplets right it's not dripping off my elbow so just a couple of sprays depending on your stamp size then you're just going to stamp lift dry why do i want to dry it why can't it just air dry well it can but if you just let it air dry to me the colors tend to muddy a little bit more because they sit there longer Okay, so they're sitting there longer and they have a chance to kind of flow into each other. But to me, by drying it, then I've got that cool watercolory look. But the beauty of this technique, as we've seen, is that we can do this again and again on so many different levels, different substrates. So let's do this on the textured side, right? Remember, Distressed Watercolor Cardstock has a smooth and a textured. I'll do a second generation. So just a couple more spritzes of water. This time we'll go on to the texture. Okay, stamp, lift, dry. The texture is very cool because it gives you more of a realistic watercolor, meaning you're gonna get all those little pits, those little nooks and crannies, if you will, those crevices for that ink to pull up differently and also leave you some white space, right? So second generation and my color is still intense. Could we do it again? Sure we can, right? Because we're doing ink. So there we go, a little spray. This is going to be our third generation. It's going to be lighter, but it's still going to be beautiful. This could be a great thing for a nice, bold tidings or maybe a beautifully embossed design, right? Simple, right? So oftentimes I like second and third generation for this technique far more. I mean, look at that. That looks like you took a brush and off you went. Very cool. But I think what lends itself to this technique that you need to be aware of, and as you saw from the very beginning, you don't have to have these stamps. So I'm not sitting here, you have to have them. But stamps that already have a watercolor look to them provide a more realistic watercolor even on third generation. And I already showed you that example with the holly. The detail was still there. Whereas this, because it already has that organic look, you're always going to get that organic look. And we can do this the same with oxide, you can do oxide on craft. There's so many different ways that, that we can take this technique. You can do this with water-based markers as well. But when it comes to the holidays, as I said, it's about time-saving tips. So let's say this was your jam. Let's say you're like, okay, you got me. I'm, I'm in it. I'm in it to win it. I want to do this. I want to create watercolor things. I want to do a, maybe I want to do this first watercolor set. And I'm going to do all my cards this way. Let's say we want to do a, a point set up, okay? You could go in with your inks like I did and you're gonna ink up each one individually. But there's also a way that you can take this and kind of create your own look and feel. Here, let me move this out of the way, okay? Your own look and feel means this. Let me bring in my little buffet tray. Uh, just because I have it. We have the ability to create custom palettes, right? That means we can create custom distress inks and oxide. These are called DIY pads, distress it yourself. It says custom blend. And what these are, these are empty ink pads, right? Completely dry, but it's the same material that is in 
a Distress Ink, and a Distress Oxide. The only difference between these are the case color. So if you have this, could you put Oxide Ink in this? Yes. If you had this one, could you use Distress Ink in it? Yes. It is exactly the same because Ink and Oxide in the Distress world is the same felt and the same case. We just made it a different color so you would be able to identify the Ink and Oxide if you didn't want to read it. Okay. The cool thing about this, of course, is that we can create custom pads. For those that have seen the demos, I think we did this one last year, maybe this one as well, uh, where you can use your re-inkers and you can create a custom pad. And once you do that, the inks will not contaminate each other. They will not cross over. That's the cool thing about this particular material, right? A, a stamp pad felt is not a paper towel. It's not felt from the craft store. It is, it's a completely different, it's a manufactured thing specifically for stamp pads that have that layer of fabric over the top, but the core of it is actually felt. That's why felt never glues perfect because it's super fibrous. This piece of fabric is to keep from all the little fluffy bits getting onto your stamps, right? So when you work with this and you create that, you can create your own custom blend. And I'll show you how to create a re-inker, uh, one with a re-inker, but you can do this with just ink. So here we have a nice little rainbow from this ink pad. You can also do oxide. This one actually has a combination of oxide and distress ink, right? Just because we were playing around and I think Vicky actually uh, played around. She's like, did you know you can do a little bit of both? Yes. So you can see the oxide are a bit more creamier. That's gonna be distress, oxide, distress. So you could mix them up if you wanted to because maybe you want something to be soft and something intense. Very cool to create ink pads. But for the holidays, if I'm going to do specific stamping, I don't need to make a rainbow pad all the time. I can make DIY drip drop pads. I call these drip drop pads because these are pads that I use when I want a specific color blend for something. Okay, so let's just say I'm doing snowflakes. Well, usually snowflakes, I like them to be a little bit more wintry, a little cooler. So I tend to do oxide. And if you look at this, that's my ink pad. That's how I made it. So instead of applying my ink in a linear fashion, like we did with these, where you see the stripes, I applied these as if I was building a puzzle. I did a color, a little color, a little color. Then I went in with another color and you just start filling in the blanks. You don't go over the same color unless you want that color to blend a little bit like I did here. But you'll see that as soon as those two colors touch each other, they stop. They're like, hey, stand back, I'm here, right? This space is occupied, occupato. So if you're doing this, you can do this with even your distress inks, right? Even if you have pink, right? Versus a dark red versus a bright red. Once an ink takes that space, it will not bleed into the next. So I love the fact that like on my green, for example, I've got a great blend of greens, everything from citron to mowed lawn to forest moss. I mean, you can see crushed olive, rustic wilderness. You could use as many colors as you want. Same thing with your browns. If you're a lover of brown and you always want that perfect who knows what, this is a great way to make that. Believe it or not, this is a drip drop, but brown is brown. You, can, might, see, you might see a little bit of light you know, from vintage photo. I did put a little bit of hickory smoke in there, but I like that. So here's how you make one, super simple. So I'm gonna take a, an ink one, cause we're gonna do ink and let's do, we'll make another green one, shall we? We could do any colors, right? You could, you could make a drip drop in a rainbow, but you, you might end up with a little bit of mud. Pretty simple, very, very addictive once you create these, okay? But just understand this, you are making a DIY pad, a distress it yourself. You are not making an ink pad that is the same quality as a manufactured ink pad. The big thing is, is if you opened a manufactured ink pad, you would see that the ink is all the way through the substrate because this felt is soaked in a tub of ink. Then it goes through a ringing process to determine the specific amount of weight that uh, this ink pad is designed to contain and distribute. When you make a DIY pad, even one that's been years, the core of it essentially stays white because our ink is only going in a little layer. And even though we use reinkers, so that really tells you how much ink is put in an ink pad. There's a lot of ink in a, in a manufactured ink pad. So this one will always stay white. It doesn't absorb like a sponge. It's ink pad material. That's the other big difference. It's not like you put it on and you're like, oh, it's gonna soak back in. It doesn't do that. And that right there, that just, that also answers people's question about how to store an ink pad. Ooh, if you store it this way, your ink is gonna sink. And if you do it this, it's wrong. It's there, it's, it's sitting there no matter. It's a suspended medium. So however you put it on is where it stays. And so how you make it is going to be really important. 
Okay, so let's just do it with these greens. I've got my ink pad. We're just gonna take our Distress Reinkers. So these are Distress Reinkers, not alcohol inks. You cannot do this with alcohol inks, but you can do this with Distress Reinker, or uh, you can also do this with Oxide. Someone asked, could you do this with Archival? Yes, you could. Uh, they actually sell DIY Archival pads. So they sell a DIY in this case. But if you didn't want this case, and let's say you just wanted to make a Distress or any kind of Archival, yes, it's the same kind of felt. Distress is just a thicker felt than what comes in an Archival pad. But yes, you could do Archival as well. So I'm just going to, when I use a Distress Reinker, I'm just gonna lift this out, squeeze first to then put the dropper in so I can suck up some of the ink. And then I'm just gonna go in and this is how I'm making a drip drop pad. If you wanna see how to make a rainbow pad, again, we've done this on the blog many times, so feel free to go back and check out that tutorial. But this is just about going in and filling in the blank. So you'll see the next color. I'm just not adding much. I mean, I am squeezing the ink because we need to put ink on an ink pad. You can't, you can't color a marker on there. That, that's not gonna be enough ink. You have to put ink on the ink pad. But just know that it's going to stay suspended. Really, really cool. So now I'm filling in the blanks. Now, if I want color to, to kind of merge together, could I go over another color? Absolutely. But just know that you're mixing the color, you're not replacing it. So just because I decided, ooh, I, I wanna put, you know, let's just take Twisted Citron, it's a bright color. You're like, ooh, I wanna, I'm gonna put that uh, over Crushed Olive. Well, now you're just gonna get a blend of that. You're not, it's not gonna dominate as Twisted Citron. It's only gonna be dominant if you put it in a, its own clean space. Right? Can you see how that's working so far? Really easy to do. The more random, the better. That's what this is all about. So many people just do the norm, which is I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a rainbow and there's nothing wrong with a rainbow. That's the coolest thing about having DIYs. You can make so many. Now people have asked too, can I clean it? Can I wash it and reuse it? Technically, yes. But you are kind of wasting a lot of product and here's why. I wouldn't recommend washing it I would just recommend re-inking it, meaning once I make kind of, let's just say this green blend, okay, once it dries out or I, I need more ink, I'm gonna go back and it's still gonna be my green ink pad. I don't have to stick to the same colors. I can use totally different colors if I want to, right? But I'm not going to make it a pink one. If you, if you went in and tried to wash it out, could you wash out most of this green and turn it pink? Yes, but by the time you wash it, wring it out, let it dry for about a week so the entire material is done, I just don't know how much time you have because your label is already going to be inked in that color. So you just have to kind of figure that out. For me, it's like you just do it, you make it, and it is what it is. But you, you make several. They're really fun to do. So once we've got the color in there, as I mentioned, ink is a suspended medium. So right now you can see exactly where everything is, even down to the little, almost a white edge in between where those colors are touching. Can you guys see that? So anytime you put ink on a pad, whether you're making one or even if you are re-inking a solid color ink pad, you need to go in with some type of scraper. It could be a gift card, a credit card. I'm just using my, my tonic scraper. I'm going to take that. I'm going to press the edge into the ink pad and I'm going to drag it across, right? I'm going to turn, edge, drag it across. Turn, press, drag it across, turn, press, drag it across. And what I'm doing, you can see it doesn't scrape off the ink. There's like minimal ink on that edge. All I was doing is instead of having that re-inker sit on the top, I pushed it into the ink pad. So that movement pushed that ink so everything connected. See now you don't have any more white lines. See the difference? It connects everything and it puts it into the ink pad instead of sitting on the top. Sometimes when people go to re-ink an ink pad, you know, if you're doing a solid color, you drizzle your ink or you do a little dot or you do a smiley face and you put the lid on and you're like, oh, I'll come back tomorrow to be perfect. And then when you go to use it, it's like darker here and darker here and darker here because wherever you drop that reinker, it's still sitting there. It's waiting to be moved into the ink pad. As I mentioned, these go through a ringing process when they're manufactured and that pressure is what pushes ink into every surface of that ink pad. Well, when you're reinking at home, you need to be sure that you're also pushing that ink back into the surface and once that ink touches the rest of it it just it it flows it just it works perfect all right so then what about labeling okay because now that we have this how do we get this to this well this you just do this you just take the ink pad and you push it right onto that sticker um, it's smaller than the label so you just kind of but you'll get the idea that that's going to be your green one 
And then you just take a paper towel, you could take a brayer, you could take a blending tool. I just kind of push some of that ink uh, out to the edge just to kind of fill in the blanks, okay? Now, the longer this ink sits on this paper, just like we did before, the darker it's going to get. So essentially, I just kind of go in and blot this off, all right? And then once it's done, I'll just wipe off the excess. If you want this to be darker, you can make it darker, but there you go, just using a paper towel. But the longer it would sit, most of that ink would have absorbed into that sticker paper. But now we have a custom blended ink pad, right? So let's take our custom blends and let's get into, there's a little oxide, it's fun. Um, let's get back into our watercolor because that's what makes, that's what makes things in my opinion for this just quicker. Right? So if I want to do a poinsettia now, I can take my custom blend and say getting out all my colors, I can just go in here and do this. And remember, I'm inking it up so I can turn my ink pad. Usually when I have a, an ink like this, I don't have to do much turning because I already know that my color is pretty random. Let's flip this one, a little spray, all right? Get some water on there. And let's just go in and stamp and lift and dry. Mm, I love it. I'll show you well some of the colors because like Age Mahogany is really one of my favorites, but you have to respect Age Mahogany. It's, it's a deep one, but I love throwing it into the flowers because you'll see, look at that. See that dark, that light. There's a lot of pink coming through. That's a little bit of kitsch. There's going to be some barn doors, some festive berries. That right there is a little Age Mahogany. Okay, now let's go to the textured side. Let's go back to this because honestly, I, I do prefer a textured side for watercolor, but I always show both because some people just, they don't like to stamp on something bumpy. I do. So I'm just going to stamp, lift, dry. So there's our little poinsettia. I'll leave that because that could be a second generation for a whole other card front. Then we could take another block. Maybe we want to take something, I don't know, something piney, right? If you will, we'll take our green one, ink that up. I got a little pine cone there. I'll take the brown one. You never know what you're going to get. Excellent. Spritz. And let's just go for it. All right, put that in there. Do a little overlap stamping. Excellent. Dry. So fast. But you'll see all the colors that we get, right? Look at that. The pine cone has all those colors, your green, all the colors, your flower, all those colors, fast, fast, fast. And you can just keep going. You can do this on any kind of paper you want. So here's a tag. So I'm going to take, I'm going to do my second generation on a tag. Why? Because we can, because we can just see what we're going to get. Second generation, a little lighter, still going to be beautiful. Can you do this over something inked? Absolutely. You can, you know, that's going to be the beauty of that. Let's take our little flower, spray that. I'm not sure how much is on here, but we'll know in a second, won't we? Right? Plenty. Beautiful. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Right? Really, really simple on how that looks. Because again, it's the stamp that is designed to have that solid watercolory look to it. But custom, I call these drip drop pads because you just, you just drip and drop. You, you put the color wherever you want to put this, but having these custom inks really give you, I think, way more creative playtime if you're doing this. Now for the oxide, let's take that guy, right? Our, our oxidey one. Maybe something's a little wintry. I don't know what I, I don't know if I have a, a wintry, I don't know if I have a wintry berry in here. Probably not. I'll make one though. Let's do, this is probably going to look, Oh, we'll just do this one. We'll do something kind of junipery. All right, take this one off, stick that one on. Oh, let's go this way. Okay. Very icy. I would normally, like I said, do this with snowflakes, but I don't have a snowflake stamp out and I'm not going to get one because <laughs> this will be fine. Just to show you that like on craft, oxide is really cool to do this technique because of that dye and pigment it really gives it such a beautiful effect that you could see. Look at that. Isn't that beautiful? So cool to do. And you could do oxide on a light paper. You, you can do any inks on any surface. It's just 
depends on what look and feel you're going for. You'll get your, you'll also kind of get your feel for water. Like you'll know when you have enough and when you don't, but that's okay. You could do this with a stamping tool if you want to. So there you go. Yeah, snowflake stamps are really, really good, Nikki. They're a lot of fun to do because, but see the, see the depth of color? That's what I love. So I wanted to share the technique that ahead of time, if you wanted to go in and do your individual colors with your ink cubes, definitely you can go for it. I mean, honestly, if I'm going to make something like a one-off or just a couple, I would do that because I, I have the ability to control where, where color is going. But if you're doing several and you have kind of your go-to colors, it's great to make that custom drip drop. And you don't always have to even stay in the same color family. Although I did because as I mentioned for the holidays, you know, like red, green, brown, you know, or blue. But you know, you take something like this, this is a great grunge color. And I think in fact, when we made this in, in the first demo, it was about, let's say as a maker, you've got your go-to palette. And we know everybody does right? You have those colors that it doesn't matter how many other colors you have or how many you add to your collection. You still have your favorites and there's, there's no shame in that, but you could go in and say, all right, well, I, I definitely like black and brown and blue. I, I like things to just have that, that look to them, that coolness. It doesn't always have to be about the stamps. It could still be, okay, now I'm going to take my custom ink pad and I'm going to take that and smash it down right? So I already know that I've just put those colors down, but I just did it spray with water. And now I'll just take some paper and we'll start doing our background. So this to me is like the perfect grunge, right? But now I'm getting all those colors fast. So there's nothing wrong with making a custom blend just on background colors. Maybe you like to do a lot of sky. Maybe you like to do whatever that is, but look at all the colors coming through there, right? Isn't that cool? So that's the fun thing about DIY. It's not for everybody. Some people don't like DIY. Some people want it like DI done. Like, oh, you need to do rainbow distress pads now. Denied. No way. Like, because you can create whatever. You're never going to choose the right color rainbow for, for anyone. It's going to be your own thing. But look at this grunge. I mean, you know that this is totally my happy place. But you might have a, a happier place with brighter colors. So... There you go. Absolutely amazing. And so you could have done, if I wanted to just do a wintry background, I could smash this one down and just do my inky winter the same way I did grunge. You guys got that? So fun, right? Could you blend from these? Yes. You can still put your blending tool and now you're going to blend a whole combo uh, the same way I did glass, uh, ink on the glass before. So anyway, just a whole nother idea. That's, I could go on and on and on, but hopefully you understand about DIY, but more importantly, watercolor. It's funny because as I was doing watercolor, uh, this is a card, I don't even know how, how long ago. This is from Zoe. Zoe made this card for one of the makes, and um, I think this was, yeah, I don't even know how many years, maybe two, three, I don't know. I love this card. Um, this is using, uh, one of my favorite stamp sets is just kind of this, this modern, I think it was called Mod Christmas. It's done with all these little halftone dots. Maybe it's not called Mod Christmas. I don't know. I think I have it in here. Let me look. Yep. Modern Christmas. See, that's pretty close. Um, it's a cool stamp set. Tammy B did an, a really cool card. That's that's 2019. 2019. Uh, because I saw it on the blog. I think I went back. And Tammy B did one, I think, where she colored these in different, like how we did the ink pads, but she colored the different geometric sections. I love this stamp set because it's just a bunch of dots. But that same watercolor, it doesn't always have to be a solid. I mean, look how cool that is by taking a, a dot. But I love how on the big dots it stayed, on the little dots it kind of filled in the blanks. And I think that's what I like the most. You can see that those heavier areas really maintain. And then just do a little smudge, some little background. So yeah, it, it always reminded me of the potential of a technique, right? That sometimes I always looked at watercolors like, oh, it's great for flowers and leaves and all that. But that was just, it was such a surprise when I saw it. And I love the, how that drip was just right, like right on the snout, right? You couldn't do that if you tried, but she did it. So anyway, it's, it's worth going back. I know a lot of the makers, um, when Tammy was talking about even going back to, 
to some of the older techniques. It is very cool to go back through your own blog or go back through your Instagram feed and see some of those old classics and be like, yeah, that was a pretty cool card, right? That was good. Um, all right, moving on. Let's go in and do, <laughs> we're just gonna do this one real quick. And we still have paste and stuff to get to, but we'll get there. We'll see how long I last. Who knows, right? Um, we're gonna talk about this. So this is the stamp timber set that we had this year. Absolutely love this set. It was one of my favorites. Uh, uh, for those that, that got this set, you had a lot of time to get it, but I'm happy for those that, that did get it. It came with a moon mask, right? And this cool stamp set. Now the moon masks are, are sold separate, uh, but the size of this particular one is kind of a, it's a bonus size. It's a size that doesn't come uh, with the set. It's kind of the in-between size. So it's a nice one, but it's really cool to take any kind of stencils or masks and also create backgrounds. In fact, let's see if I have that in here. I should, I should have it um, just to talk about, cause I think I've done, I think I even saw it where we did some, yeah, we've done some moons before, right? So you can do moon techniques using sprays and inks. You can also do moons for, for blending, right? It's just a fun way that you can create a background by taking a moon mask and doing this. And you could really do this with any kind of stamp. So yeah, a shout out to Simon. I really love this set. It was one of those that I said tomorrow, probably for the first time. Gosh, that, that is a great, that is a great set. Okay, drying this off. Just gonna go in, that's that little scrap of sticky grade. So I'll just do a quick little, quick little moon, okay? So I'm gonna take my sticky grid. I'm just gonna cut a piece of this. Make a little sticky square. All right. Just a place. Now you could use a lot of things. You can use double stick tape, you, something removable. You can use pixie spray, whatever it is that you want to do. But I mean, this is going to work because I'll be able to place this down wherever I want that to be. Just kind of move it around. All right, that's going to work. Then I will take, in fact, let's just take, <laughs> because it's here, I'm going to take that mixed pad. This was not something I was ready for. Can you tell? I can't tell at all. You can't tell? No. I can tell. I can tell because like the popcorn in my head right now is popping so loud I can barely hear myself. All right? That's what this is. All right. I'm going to take, just put on a new piece of foam. Now you could go in and just dip right into here. Not really not going to matter. Right? But when you do that, because there's not as much ink on this pad as there was a regular ink pad, a lot of times with these, if I'm going to blend or do anything, see how you can push ink? Remember, ink is suspended, so when you press down, that ink comes and delivers from the ink pad. I find this just easier to get ink if I'm going to blend from a DIY, just, just so you know. Because to try to get this out, remember, the blending foam is not designed to absorb a lot of color. That's its, that's its purpose. So I'm just picking this up, just going around here. I, I'm not even thinking about it. I don't care how messy and mucky the blend is because it's gonna get a lot, a lot muckier. All right, so once I have that, take a little shady color. Maybe I'll go in with a little ice spruce. Don't forget to use your ink palette for just that, ink. You don't always have to go into your ink pad with that tool right? Especially if you want to stick to the same type of tool, right? You don't want to change your foam because I'm kind of sticking on, you know, blue on blue. That's going to work. All right. Then we'll take this and peel this off. Nice. Excellent. Okay. Now I'll just take this. I'm going to spray. Okay. I want some of that water to just start wicking in there. Oxide's not going to wick nearly as much as uh, distress, but what's going to happen is not only we're going to get a little bit of a bleed, but we're going to get that little bit of almost starriness. Remember what we did with the drips on that last tag? Well, same rules apply on this one. So we're going to leave it there for a second, a few seconds with a heat tool. And we'll take it, paper towel, go in, dismount. Beautiful background, right? And see, that's what I really like about when you're not such a perfectionist on blends, 
you just get like a whole different look, a whole different vibe, like when we stamp trees or just anything on there. I think sometimes people just really get caught up in the blend. There's nothing wrong with that, but it's good. Oh, I see a bunch of shout outs to Diane. Hello, darling. Di's here. Hey, Di. So I think when, when it comes to just creating your backgrounds, yes, you could, you could blend to perfection all you want, but you can also just go in and mix. And that's the other beauty of creating one because just answer yourself honestly and be honest as a maker are you going to get out all of those colors to do a background nah maybe one maybe two but are you gonna i think this one has two four six seven colors in there you're probably not going to but when you see it it's like wow that's actually pretty cool and you did it right from that ink pad squishing it down and off you go right so then the cool thing about a moon mask is you also get that little positive piece right that that extra extra little element. So we're going to do a, another little bit of, another little bit of stick. It's great for this because I can position this down. Okay. Go right in that. And you can, you can shape this however you want. Really you, you do you. Okay. For this, mm, I think I want to go into something a little bit cleaner, a little easier. Let's take a blending brush. Uh, whenever something is super detailed, I prefer to go in with a brush versus a foam. So I'll go in with brown. Brown will be fine. And I think I'll take a little antique linen. Antique linen, of course, is going to be a great color. I'll just drop it right back in there because that's going to allow me just to pick up the color right from there, right, without having to try to hold on to that. And I'll still position that even though I've got that little bit of uh, stick on there. And just go in with a brush and just kind of work this around, right? So it just depends on how soft you want this to be. I want this to be a little bit more, I don't know, kind of organic. So I'm even going on the outside of that moon, right? So it almost has a little bit of a, a grungy glow, but still not bothered with it. Take that, slide this up, cap, close, done. All right, take this off. Look at that, perfect. Simple, right? Easy, easy. I want it to be a little organic, so I'm going to do a little splatter of water. Do I have to do the whole thing? Nope, we already did the background, but I still want to do it there. It's going to add a little bit of bonus there. All right, dab that off. Perfect, simple moon background. And now you can do whatever it is you want to do. Remember when I said if you're going to do some stamping, what do we want to do? Well, we want to go in and we want to dry this. So. Dice says she's rubbish on commenting. That's all right. I am too. Right? Yeah, I left her, I left her comment, but I don't think she saw it. I told her we were speaking about her earlier about the dish bubbles. Yes, the dish bubbles. Uh -huh. the, what do they call it? Fairy, fairy, fairy liquids or yeah. something like that? That's what they call the... Yeah. yeah special bubbles. They have special bubbles. Okay. Um, so, same thing. I'm going to stamp. We'll take this guy. Mm, he's going to be great there. That'll be fun, All right? Place that down. And again, just sharing that you can do with that card, that special card. I don't want that to, anything to happen to that. Just going to archival it. All right, go in, stamp with purpose, no CPR, but just good pressure. Look at that. Wonderful. And we could just keep going. We could add the little you could add the little sparkly bits. I think that'll be fun. The whoosh that I call it. I like that. But really, it, it's it's just more about creating a background with a DIY than it is creating a finished thing. I don't normally create a, a finished thing, but I will. I'll finish this, just not on camera. But that's just to show you how fun it is to use that drip drop pad to create not just watercolor, but also to use it for your backgrounds. Okay? That's what's really, really important. That when you're working with stuff, that you use it for more than just that one idea, right? So you may watch the demo and you're like, oh, I'm, I did that ink pad because I'm gonna use it for, you know, poinsettias. Well, no, like, yes, but you could use it for so much more. Uh, Valentine's Day, anytime you want uh, some, some type of cool red background, maybe even for die cutting, right? And another cool thing about a background like this is taking something over the top. So we're gonna take one of the mica stains absolutely love these. I'm going to take a little bit of the frosted juniper and I'll take a little bit of snow flurries, right? 
my little custom tin. Okay. We're just going to add to these. Let me get my splat box. Okay. Shake those and these. So could I mist it? Yes. But could I splatter it? Yes. And that means I'm going to make sure it's ready to go. And I'm just going to give it some little fine, little fine spritzes really. Okay. That one's a little frosted juniper. This one, there we go. That was snow flurries. So what I did is instead of commit and do a nice mist, I just hesitated and that's what gave me that little splatter. See? So when those dry, it's just gonna give me a little, little sparkle, little mica. Nice. Okay, let's dry that. I agree, I love the mica stains too. Really, really uh, just fun. Yeah, no, the mica, the mica stains, the mica stains are still out there. There are people that, you know, said they were gone. They're still out there in, in select stores. I mean, they're, they're gone from Ranger. They're definitely sold out for the season from Ranger, but some places still have them, right? Yeah, we saw some. <laughs> yeah, we do. Yeah. So there you go. Just adding a little splatter. The point is that you can build on whatever it is that you're creating with these components. Everything that you've learned or watched the demos, we can continue to build on that. Okay. So. I think I'm going to jump to, I think I'm going to jump to stencils and then I'll share like one other technique if, if I'm up to it. Let's see. Let's try to move. What do you want? Well, I'm just going to set this here for now. That's good. All right. I'm going to clean up a little water again on the mat, off the mat. Right. Or if you're like Diane, remember that time at, uh, I don't know if Di is still here, but I remember at the Carson show, when we were demoing at the Carson stamp show and I gave her a media mat, she, I don't know how many of these she went through a day, but she's like, this one came off. This one came off. I'm like, what are you doing? I don't know. They're not sticking to the glass. You just kept on giving her new ones. Right. I did. I kept giving her new ones, but then I went over and you know, she had all her ink sprays everywhere. And then she would just take the cloth, the, her kitchen roll and she would just go across the whole thing. And she was basically like shoving all the ink, like <laughs> right underneath the sheet. I need a new one. And then it was just rolling off. I just remember that. I'm like, here's another one. Here's another one, but I don't know what you're doing. And then, yeah, when I finally got up, got up to check it out. She needed a new one. She loved it. It was good. Okay, let's go. Let me grab these over here real quick. I'm going to go back to these guys. Uh, these are the ones, you remember, that we did the paste and we did the powder. All right. So this one, matte texture paste with gold powder, not heated yet because we still have to emboss it. Same thing, but look at that background. Mica stain with gold, that's gonna be, that's gonna be stunning. And then we've got this one, right? This is going to be Crackle. Now I will tell you just from looking at it, probably a poor stencil choice on my part because only, you, you're gonna see a little bit of Crackle on these small ones. I can only see a lot of it like in the pine cone. It is what it is, all right? So at this point, this technique people ask all the time, how do you know if it's dry? Well, this is one of those that you really shouldn't touch because if you touch it, that powder is going to come off on your fingers. So you don't want to do that. You just kind of wait. If you give it 15 minutes, at least we're good. Okay. So next we're going to emboss it. Um, I've said it before. I'll say it again. Not my favorite for embossing. It is a great tool. Uh, I use it for everything else. 99.9% .9 of everything else, just not embossing. Could you emboss with it? Yes, you can. It just takes a little longer. Okay. This though, for those that watch the demo, where do you see this? This is slick. Look at this a friend gifted me this brand new heat tool. If you've watched my demos, you know that the heat tool that I've had, my favorite heat tool, it would either work or not work. Um, this one's awesome. Yeah, this is actually, uh, it's, a, it's a very cool tool just because of how it's angled. It took me a while to get used to it because you know normally it's, it's, it's like a straight heat tool and you like hold the back, but if you hold the back of this, you cover the vents, but you can see that little landing spot for the palm of your hand. It's so good to use. I always take the little kickstand off of mine. That's just me. Um, it's a Wagner heat tool. It's awesome. It's got two settings, right? And, and no, Wagner didn't send it. When I say a friend sent it to me, it wasn't Wagner that sent it to me. No, but see, it's got a high and a low. I work on the low. The low gets super hot, right? I love it. So I'm just going to heat it up just to make sure I kind of feel it in my hand. That's where my hand is resting. But I swear it kind of feels like I'm embossing with my finger because I'm like pointing at it and then it's just cooking away. All right, let's emboss this. So here we're just going to point, we're gonna let that powder melt and you'll see, especially with the gold, it's just like molten love right here. 
Now, if you have it on high, will it emboss faster? It will, but it's also not good for video. So when I'm just doing my regular embossing, I've got it kicked on high. But look what's happening. You see that? All right. I'm just going to heat that up. Another tip whenever you're embossing is, I'm going to turn this up just to go, but um, always try to hold up your paper. If you can hold your paper off of a surface, whether that is with your fingers or maybe you want to use a wooden clothespin or something like that, that's going to allow the heat to pass through it and your paper will remain flat, right? If you emboss it on the table, your, the ends of your paper, al they're always going to curl because heat rises, so it needs to get out from underneath it. So let's go to this now. I'm just going to fire it up. There we go. See, now it's going to be like a barcode reader. See how fast it embosses? It's freaking fast. I love it. Look at that. Done. Holy moly. All right. Here's this one. Hopefully you guys can hear me. I mean, look how fast it is. And just the angle, it's so much more comfortable. It's crazy. Who knew? I mean, a heat tool has always been like that straight stick for years, as long as I've been stamping. So well done, Wagner. It's awesome. Look at that. Yeah. Absolutely beautiful, beautiful. Yeah, it doesn't poof because the paste is what acted as our glue, right? The paste didn't dry and it fell off. Remember, we put this powder on when the paste was wet, therefore it stuck. Okay, it is freaky fast. It's crazy. It's like a barcode reader. Okay, here's this one, Crackle. So this one, of course, is glazed. So now we're going to see that the color becomes like translucent. It's just going to be like this little tinted glass. Very pretty. I love the look of this too. We'll also get some of that to crackle a little bit. The subtlety of a glaze, I just think is what is so impactful. And I'll show you some other pieces. I might have some in my tin from a, an earlier demo so you can see it, right? So you can see it's something other than Christmas. But all we're doing is just going in and embossing. It's done, done, okay? Cool, right? It's like, it is like, oh my gosh, yeah. So, thank you. I'll say my friend, but it, it was Heidi at Simon. <laughs> Just because she kept watching and she felt bad for me because she was watching the live where, for those watching, you know that like every time I turned on my old heat tool, cool Mario had to like take a can of cold air to like cool it off. And so she's like, I'm sending you something. I think you need it. I'm like, I don't really need anything. And then there was that. There it is. Okay. So let's take a look at this one. See what I mean by it looks like glass, just like shattered glass because the glazes have such a shine, but you can also see that crackle again, probably bad stencil. Uh, choice on my part, but I still love the look of it. I can now ink this, I can spray this, I can do any of that because the paste and that glaze are set. It's just a beautiful background. This, so rich looking. So what I like about this, of course, is that we're getting the, the thickness of the texture paste, but we're getting that molten look of an embossing powder. And whatever color embossing powder you use, that will ultimately show. But look how it looks on the mica stain background. Wow. Yeah. And then this one is mica stain. Oh man, I love that green with the gold, a little bit of oxide. So cool, so what do you use these for? Well, this could be a background, this could be a tag, you could do some die cutting, you could cut these out. It's just a great way that you can use your stencils um, a different way. Like for me, it's, it's just about a different way. I'm gonna spray this one real quick while Mario's just hanging out. He's right there. Uh, Okay, let's see, what do I want to use? Oh, I don't want to use Villainous, that's going to be too dark. Walnut's going to be too dark. Let's do a little frayed, okay, a little frayed burlap. So this, put back in the little tray. Okay, just some spray stain, just to start. Dry, could you use an embossing gun? Yes, but yeah. Oh, there it is, what's it called? Wagner Precision. Oh, see, that's a, that's, it's a good name for it. Uh, HT400 or HT500. Let me look and see. Oh, see, they they could have just called it TH. That would have been TH. What is this? Where do you find that? I don't know. I'll look. Okay, don't touch the metal tip. No, I won't. You see the big warnings? All right. So here I'm just drawing some stain on here. It's very good. Yeah. Okay. It doesn't say which one. Doesn't? No, it doesn't say it, but I know that Simon had just put the link. Yeah, so I guess if you click the link, maybe the link will tell you yeah. which one. Maybe. Okay. I like this. This is nice, Mario. Hanging out. It's good. 
because it allows me to kind of look for things that I misplaced. All right, here's another one. Take a little blending brush. I just want to add some color just to show how you can uh, mix this up. Where is my, man, what are you looking for? my DIY, there we go, the brown, okay, custom blend. So it's the HT 400. Okay. And Simon's got the link there. I'm going to pick up some ink. Thanks again, Simon. And I'm just going to take this now because I want to focus the color. So the thing about the blending brush, if I leave it open like this, see how the bristles can flare out, right? And that's cool, right? So that, that can create a really nice blend. But if I want to focus some color in areas, I can ink this up, slide this forward. That's going to make the, the bristles more compact. And then I can focus that color around certain areas. So a lot of times for this technique, and I won't do every image, but you'll get the idea, is that then you can go behind it with a, a color that you use similar to the glaze and you can highlight it. So see how I was just able to take a little bit of that custom brown and do the brown, right? So if I want to do the green, see, I just said I wasn't going to do all of it. Welcome to my brain. Yet here I am, right? So next we could take the green, Take a green brush, pick that up, slide that forward just so it's more compact and literally follow what you're doing. Just to add some color. I just think it's a very cool way and <laughs> some of those berries that didn't get stuck down all the way are flaking off. I like that. Um, it's just a really cool way to add another level of color to that that background and this to me this leaves a nice landing spot for a stamp or anything like that but I love the texture of it because really in in person I don't know if the camera's picking up but you can see the crackle see the crack right there on the berry it just looks like crackled glass it's very very a little extra bit um, it's beautiful on a card and this could have been on any kind of background but again another use for and get that little bit another use for your customs okay so we saw texture paste. There's a lot of things you can do with texture paste too, guys. I just wanted to pick out a couple of a couple of techniques that you might like and enjoy. All right, everyone doing okay? We're hanging in there. Okay. Okay. Let me just clean this off. So let me tell you uh, a little trick on a stencil that I learned from uh, a, a maker that I follow on Instagram. Her name is Shari Shari Moss, I believe is her name. Uh, and I saw this on her Instagram feed and I'm like, what? And like, I was like, my fingers couldn't type fast enough as to reading about what it was. But here's the thing. I don't know if you guys uh, feel the same. So this is what my stencil bucket, I, I normally don't show it, but this is what it looks like at the end of a demo. Everything sits in there. The reason I like doing this, and this is just cold water, okay? But it could be warm, it doesn't matter. But when you're done with the stencil, if you throw this in here, the water will literally dissolve. So even that paste that's on the palette knife, just watch with your finger. Like it just dissolves the medium right off of it. So on your stencils, even though we had all that paste, it's, it's just gone. It's just water that's left. Now, usually what I would do is, is go through a pile of paper towels. I'm not gonna lie, right? I would have this, we would then take these out, right? You'd shake them. You could rinse them if you wanted to, but I mean, you don't need to, but then I would lay it on a paper towel and a paper towel and a paper towel. And I don't know, if, I don't know about you guys, but I always struggled with like, especially when you have a lot of stencils, you're inking like, where do you put them without using up your stencils? She showed this. Now she had one that looked like grass, right? It was green and I, I wasn't into that. But when I looked it up, the company is Boone. This is actually for baby bottles. It's a baby bottle dryer. So it's this plastic thing. See, they're like these little, it, they're not rubber. They're actually a hard plastic. They're like these little plasticky things with drain holes and a tray. And, and they do make it that look like grass. They make like a skin, a skinny one. I think that's what she had, but um, I got mine at Target. But when I saw it, I'm like, Ooh, cool. I don't, I, I need more than just one. Cause I think she had like one or two stencils in it. But what's cool about this is now when you take out your stencils, you just take them out and you just get to set it in there. How freaking slick is that, right? No, this is not an information for them. I don't even know them. I don't, I don't need baby stuff. So, but this is what's great is that your stencils can sit in there. They can dry all of the, whatever comes off is going into this tray. And then all you have to ever clean is just what's in that tray. 
How slick is that? Yep, baby bottle drying rack. Different colors, different sizes. Yes, yes, yes. This is what I purchased. I like that it was gray. I like that it was big enough to fit these stencils. And obviously, you know when I'm making, I go through a lot of stencils and you can stick them up this way, this way. I mean, I would imagine that if you did a lot of inked backgrounds, this would also be cool, right? For doing your ink backgrounds or, you know, inked envelopes that Tipa does, like anything that you need to drawing, I think is kind of cool because then you can just clean it. It's plastic. Yeah, I like it. So a neat little tool. So that's where my stencils are. I was just excited. Anytime you can find like a tool out of creative convenience, it just makes making easier. And also I'm not wasting an entire pile of paper towels, which I do. I mean, I reuse the paper towels. We dry them again, but it's just kind of a annoying. Okay, moving on. We're gonna show, I've got two more things. I'll talk about this for stencils and then I'll finish up with one other uh, technique. So we'll talk about shifters and there are uh, demo videos on my blog about shifters. I just like to talk about them, especially around the holidays, because if you understand a shifter stencil, you can use them so much for the season. You really can. There are a variety of shifters, right? We have polka dots. These are the new shifter multis where you can get different size dots. We also did shifter multi in stripes uh, and Harlequin. We've done different kind of shifters like this is one with peppermint. We do trees. I like to do a swatch of, of shifters. I've had some just through the years, just to show like for Halloween, for example, that you can take dots and make a Halloween pattern, but it's the same one that, you know, you can just change the size dots, change the size colors, and you can use stuff for Halloween, but then you can also use elements for, for Christmas, right? I love creating backgrounds. This is one of my favorite shifters. This was a couple of years ago, um, and, and Stamper still makes it. This is a candy stripe, right? I love that that alternating stripe, because look how cool that is when you when you see it in green. This is the regular size and the mini because uh, the regular shifters come in two sizes. This is the shifter multi, and all that is just showing you like a different width of, of stripe, right? So you could buy these, these come in a, a pack of three. They're just a lot of fun to create colorful backgrounds for the holidays if you don't have a lot of stamps, right? Sometimes just the budget prevails and you don't have a lot of background stamps for Christmas or whatever that is. If you have some, some shifters, it does allow you just to change your color palette and use very simple repeat patterns. But see, like there's the Halloween, there's the Christmas. Like how great is that for the stencil? And you could use it for obviously birthday, Easter, Americana, whatever you want to do. Um, because these stencils are nice and long, it'll create a nice card front panel if you wanted to do that. I like mine to be a little splotchy. And again, there's videos to show how to use it, how to prep it, to do paint. They're very easy. But what I wanted to, to talk about is that when you use a shifter or a stencil for that matter, it doesn't really have to be a shifter. I just happen to do that. It's really fun to add a little bit of sparkle to it, right? That's one of those things that when you use a stencil, a lot of times people don't think to do anything else to that stencil outside of a texture paste. But if you're just doing inking, you can apply a lot of the same products that we would normally use with our stamps with your stencils, right? So this is, this is a cool shifter, right? So here you can see that when we first did it, it was red. So we did the little red peppermints and then we shifted it and then we were able to do the green mints. That's essentially how a shifter works. But then when we're done inking, then I went back and added the glitter. And so I'm just gonna share how I did that, right? So I'll just take one of these. Why not? Because it's already done. That's why I'm going to do that one. I thought I had, I thought I had a tree. Do I have a tree? Maybe I do. Oh yeah, here's a tree. Let's do that one. Cause that's fine. I just, I, I think it's going to be more exciting for a shape than, than just some stripes. Let me open this little ring. It's always like, which way does it go? There we go. We'll take this off. This is a shifter. Now I just have to find the stencil. Oh boy. Let's see. Well, I may have it out and I may not. That, that is the question. Thanks. Let's see. I may have already, you, you know, selected it as one of my holiday ones and I, oh, I did. Well done, Mr. Holtz. There you go. Okay. There's our shifter. Okay. Here's how we're going to glitter, glitter the shifter. Okay. You essentially don't want to do this each color, 
because what's going to happen is, especially if you're adding glitter, we're adding texture, I wouldn't just ink this and then glitter it and then try to shift to the next color because your stencil is not going to want to lay flat for the next color because there's going to be a little crunchy layer. So usually when I'm, I'm doing this technique, I would do my tag or background or whatever with the shift. Then I'm going to go back and do my glitter. And here's how we're going to do it. So we still have our shifter, right? And so for this one, our tree, just so you can see, there's one color. And then when we've shifted it, there's another. Isn't it cool? It's always like a, a game or a trick. So we're going to work with sticky embossing powder. I prefer sticky embossing powder for glitter because it's kind of a more of a guaranteed win. Um, I've seen like Stacy use frosted crystal and you can definitely uh, try that if that's what you have and that's what works. I just personally prefer sticky just because it's, well, it's just stickier and easier. But again, you, you do it. You do whatever's going to work for you. Okay. Next, I'm going to take a piece of, we'll just use what's left of that sticky grid, place that down. We're going to take this. We'll take a little bit of tape. Okay. So first I'll go in and line up a color. In this case, it's going to be green because that's going to be my first one. And I do want to line up my images the best I can. Stick down that piece of tape. So what we're going to use for this is I'm going to work with Distress Embossing Ink and a domed foam. Okay. Could you do other things? Well, there's a lot of options. Could you go in with, say, embossing pens and color each one? Yes. Could you go in with the dabber? I tried that and it was a hot mess, guys. Um, the dabber just had way too much ink and it oozed out everywhere and I just didn't like it. So I found that the embossing ink and the dome foam worked the best. We're going to work with rock candy glitter. Now you can use an entire jar if you wanna just pour it on, or you can use a glitter duster. And a glitter duster is just an empty device that you pour your glitter into. You flip that little lever out, you just swivel it, right? So it just kind of unlocks and I'll just show you in the splat box. When you press down, it just, dust glitter. Can you guys see the glitter coming out? Probably not. Oh, you can kind of see it. Well, I just got to see if I can get the light. Oh, there. Now you see it, guys. That was perfect. Oh, well, where? Right there? No, a little, little, little <laughs> See, it's hard. The oh, there we yeah, go. There. See that? Mm -hmm. So every time you do that, it just dusts out. It just dispenses the glitter. And the glitter can go back in the jar if you use a splat box, okay? That's just nice if you don't want it to uh, go in and I think sometimes, you know, when you when you use glitter, especially certain metallics, and you pour it on there, sometimes you get a bigger dump of glitter than what you want. So you do what's going to work best for you. What do you got? Uh, what? What? What's the, what's the question? Do you have to keep the embossing pad flat? Mine leaked everywhere. Um, it's a good idea to keep it flat. You, you don't have to. Um, but, yeah, I, I mean... I, if it's leaking, then keep it flat is all I can tell you, because that is the other thing. You know, we talk about ink pad storage in general, oxides, inks, everything, you know, depending on where you live, depending on the altitude, depending on humidity, depending on all that. Some people, if they try to store their ink pads on their sides, they leak everywhere. And the solution is, well, then you can't store them on your side where you live. That is just it. But, but from a, like a manufacturer recommendation, you can even see from the storage tin, it's okay. It's like, that's how they're sold. That's how they're displayed. You can store them. But like on this tin, if I was in a place where they leaked, which I'm not, I live in Arizona, it's dry. Um, but if so, like the tin could also be used this way where your ink pads are flat. So it shouldn't leak, but if it's leaking where you live, then my advice is just to store it flat and then it, it won't do that. All right. So um, thanks. I'm going to use that splat box. Okay. So here we go. We're going to work with sticky powder. We're going to work with glitter in that and we're going to use our embossing ink. Okay. But that's the glitter that we're using. And I just need to find my piece of scrap paper, which is here. It's like all systems go. Let's move this off to the side. Hopefully that answered your question in a very odd kind of vague way, but that was good. What kind of ink was used on the trees? Distress, just regular distress ink with a, with a blending tool. Okay. So I'm just, you can see my embossing ink is well loved. I love a well loved embossing ink. I'm just going to put that right onto the foam. Going to line up my stencil. And I'm just going to go in and pounce that ink right through. I don't need to go in a circular motion. That's why I like the domed foam. The dome is squishy enough that it's going to get into all those little areas. I'll make a couple of passes. Okay. It really shouldn't transfer on here. Okay. If, if you're getting ink transfer, then you probably have too much uh, 
ink or you've gone over it too many times. You really don't need a lot. A little embossing ink goes a long way because it is glycerin based. We're gonna flip this over, take this off, put it on a piece of scrap paper, sticky embossing powder. It's just embossing powder called sticky. And pour this over the top. Shake off the excess over here, over here. Use the jar as a little tapper. I'm really not a flicker. I don't like to flick embossing powder because I think too much of it comes off. So there we go. Here's what we have right now. Not sure what that little bonus is. That's probably me. But so we have our sticky powder on there. So far, so good. Excellent. We're going to set that off to the side. I'm going to put this back into the jar because we're going to need to use it. Well, maybe I won't use it again. You'll see it once, but I'll give you the I'll give you the whole whole little demo. Okay. So sticky embossing powder, if you think of it, whoop, a little sticky grid. Hey, there we go. Is essentially powdered glue, right? That's how you have to look at it. It has a very, very low melting point. So you could use the Ranger heat tool for that. It's completely up to you. Um, if you use a glitter duster for this, you will get a very light amount of sparkle, right? You saw how it was dusting. If you want a lot of sparkle, you're going to want to pour this on because when this melts, it will become sticky. When it becomes sticky, you have literally seconds to apply whatever you want to stick to it. So you need to have that at the ready. So if you're using the duster, that little bit of air from the duster on sticky powder is also cooling or drying the glue. And so you'll get less glitter sticking to it. But maybe that's what you want, right? Sometimes you want a card that only has a subtle amount of sparkle to it. So you do have options. Just for the sake of the demo, I'm gonna just dump it on there, okay? I'm gonna still use my splat box just because I don't want glitter everywhere, but yeah, you can do either one. So I've got my rock candy ready, and here we go. Like I said, you can use whatever heat tool, but once you, if you have one of these, like, come on, come on, come on, good, okay. I always heat it up, right? Just put it in your hand. You'll know if it gets hot. That's how you know. You, there's no reason to blow cold air on embossing powder. You're just gonna have a better chance of blowing it off uh, the surface, okay? Same thing, picking it up. So watch what happens. When we heat this, it's going to go clear. So I'll just show you on a tree. Right, you see that? So here's what I like to do. I, well, I should have started here. I will start here. That's all right, I'll go back to that. Maybe I can save it, maybe I can't, okay. I'm gonna go and heat these up. Right in a row. You guys see them all melt, there we go. Then I'll make one other pass, turn this off, take my glitter and I'm gonna go against the tag. You guys see that? So I didn't, well this one I already heated by accident, but I didn't, I didn't pour the glitter where the powder is. The reason is, is you won't have enough open time to heat the whole thing and emboss the whole thing. So do it in stages. This one I might get to, to reheat, but we'll see in a second. So I'm gonna do the next row. I'm not doing anything to that glitter right now. It can just sit in that glue right now and dry. So I'm just heating, 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 heating. We're gonna reheat this in the hopes that it melts again. Who knows? I'll make one more pass up the channel, then take my next thing and just just a row of glitter. Again, shake it off. Moving on. Next row, you guys see what we're doing? So next one, I'm gonna go opposite because I don't like to heat into my finger. So as long as you can pour away from wherever that powder one is, it doesn't really matter where you're going. Okay, you guys see how that's embossing? Just turning clear, then I make one other pass just to make sure that it's hot. Take my glitter. Pour that on, and we'll make one more final pass. This row, and it seemed like it stuck, so if you happen to overheat another row, don't freak your freak. Just keep going. As long as you, I think, reheat it, that glue will become sticky enough, at least for this. There's that row, and glitter. Okay, so once our glitter's on there, I'm just gonna pour a little bit over that. All right, excellent. That's what I've got so far. So once that's done, I want the glue to dry, okay? Because this was powdered glue, so it gets sticky when you heat it, but we also need it to dry. Now you can let it air dry, probably take a minute or so, or you can just go over it with a heat tool 
and we're not melting it. And you could use the craft tool if you didn't want to use this one. We're just going to make sure that that's set. And this is what I like to do. I'll set that there for a second. I'm just going to pick up the glitter that I have. I'll put this back in. Remember rock candy doesn't go airborne. So this is a great glitter to use because it has different particle sizes. It's clear. It doesn't have any iridescence, but it also doesn't go in the air. So this one I don't mind using inside because it doesn't, doesn't go everywhere. Now, once we have this on there, you can see that there is glitter kind of around the outside areas. Can you see that? It's not just on here, but it is only stuck to this. This part is just a static charge. Now you can go in with your hand and you can rub that off. I just, you do whatever you want. I just use a, a dry brush. I happen to use a collage medium brush because I like that it's just, it's kind of flat and rigid. And I'm just gonna go in and just dust this off. Okay, and that extra glitter can also go back. So you can see I'm really aggressive. And could you go in with your hands? Yes, it doesn't matter. The glitter is on there. You put it on there, okay? But I just prefer to use a brush. But this is what I love about the technique. Like, look at how perfect it's glittered, right? It's as if you went in with glossy accents and a tiny little paintbrush or a needle tool and did this. And I would tell someone I did. I'd be like, oh, you know I did. I used a wire and a needle. That's what makes this technique so cool because from a background, it's absolutely beautiful. It's so simple to do. And I actually like this. I like just having one row of trees glittered because that just makes for a beautiful, beautiful background. Great card. You can do a sentiment. I would definitely put something right over these blobs that I have no idea. I've had this swatch for a long time though, but isn't that cool? A cool technique. That's all I want to show. You may have seen this before. I'm sure I've shared it. I've done this with stamps because you can stamp an image the same way, emboss with sticky, put your glitter on it. I've shown many demos, but I think sometimes we don't think about using our stencils and glitter to create a cool background because these could be applied. These happen to be just on plain backgrounds, but we could have still done this over another inked background. And I inked this afterwards. I went in with frayed burlap and antique linen afterwards and the glitter does not come off, right? Just fun, a cool way, something different. That's what I was hoping um, this demo would inspire is that it would just be like, oh, I've seen that technique. Oh, hey, okay, stencils. Yeah, that could be cool. That's a, a cool background for my gift tag or whatever that is. All right, we got one more. I can do it. Can you do it, Mario? Yes. We're good? Okay. Perfect. So let me just move some of this out of the way. Whoa. Oops. Bye-bye, heat tool. Um, so this one has, this has embossing ink. Same thing. Goes in the water, right? It'll come off and that's good. Thanks, Mario. You're welcome. Here, I'll put that right in its little. I just, I just missed the basket. That was my problem. I went to throw it over there and I totally missed the basket on that. All right. Got these here. Let me grab this. Really, I can hand you anything or take anything. Okay. In your way. Um, I'll take this and this. Actually, I need to, you know me, I got to do a little, little cleaning up. Little, little, little there's some glitter thing. there. You know, I always say like, don't, don't work in, in chaos. Some people like to work in chaos, right? There's, if you ever watch a, a Dina Wakely, like that's, that's her jam. So if it works for you, do it. But if, if sometimes you know, swimming through the chaos stifles your ability to, to create, then just take a second just to give yourself a space. And that, again, I, I talk about the media mat all the time. That's why I designed it, really. I mean, I've, I've used craft sheets, I've done all that, but I love having a safe making space. So if you looked on the outside of this media mat, it's literally piled with product all the way around. We'll show it at the end, but this is my safe space. So I push everything off the glass and I always have a space of where I'm creating, okay? So for this one, we're going to do a double stamping technique using uh, colors. Now, again, if you followed any of the, the seasonal videos in the past few years, I've shared this technique. It's a fun technique. Uh, many makers have adapted this technique in so many different ways. I know Zoe did one uh, where she did Halloween for Christmas. Many of the makers did this technique uh, and show different ways. Essentially what it is, is you take an image and you stamp it there you go. This happens to be one of the Santas, maybe from last year. He's on craft paper. This is stamped with archival because we know that archival is, anyone say it out loud, waterproof. So we stamp with a waterproof ink first. Then you go in in color. Now, the cool thing about craft is that you can color a lot of different things. We can color paint. 
Uh, we can color with oxide. You could just do any kind of coloring with this, but I love something pigment based on craft because that's what's going to show up, right? The pigment is what's gonna pop. This was done with paint. But you can see when you do pigment that you start to lose the detail of your image because the pigment is dominating the dye. But then what we do is we go in and we stamp it again. So you kind of have the beginning, the middle, and the end because it brings back all of our detail. Isn't that cool? A great way to stamp, color, and stamp again. This does require a stamping tool of some sort or a positioner because we're, you need to ensure that you line it up. So I just wanna take you through uh, how to do it, but I'm gonna do something a little different this year, right? Because in the past, as I mentioned, um, we have done this with paint. So this technique is done with paint. You can see that, that's a, another cool stamp. You want something that's gonna have open areas because we're going to color. This is that same technique using oxide as our color. So paint is gonna be very vivid. Oxide is going to oxidize. But this year we had something new. We had something new to the mix. And for me, I'm like, well, hey, we got something new. I'm gonna try it. And that would be the new mica crayons. And I was like, oh, hello. Merry festive goodness right there. Because I got the vividness of paint, but I got that little bit of shimmer from the mica. So this is done with the distressed mica crayons, the ones that we did uh, for the seasonal sets. So that's what I'm gonna demo. I'm gonna demo. So you can see this technique can be done with many things, but this, this effect, like look at that. I mean, come on. That is a whole lot of yum right there. All right? So yeah, which, which definitely made me order more sets from Ranger because I'm like, okay, at this rate, I'll be out of crayons by February. So, and they're still in stock, so I got them. Because when these are gone, they're, they're gone until next season. And then next season, there'll be different colors. So I needed these colors. So we're gonna work with the crayons. And we'll do this one. We're gonna work with a little cozy Christmas. That'll be fun. This is just a swatch that I did of the crayons just to, again, swatches are, swatches are life, guys. So these are the crayons on white, this is on craft, and this is on black. So this technique could be done on any kind of substrate. Obviously your stamped image isn't gonna appear on black, so you may wanna stick to one of these. But you can also do a lot of watercolor, right? So if, if you don't want the intensity of the color, you want it a little bit uh, more fluid, you can certainly watercolor with these as well because distressed crayons are a water-reactive pigment, right? So let's take this, I'm gonna get my stamp platform for this. Okay, there we are. So for this one, we're gonna take this and I am not going to use the magnets, okay? Not at all for this. And here's the reason. Because I know that the, the success uh, of this technique totally relies on being able to line up your stamp that second time, right? And so even if you're just a little bit off, then the rest of your image is a hot mess. And I just don't trust myself, the magnets, any of that, okay? So I'm gonna take a piece of sticky grid. I don't have any smaller stuff here, so I'll just chop up a piece. Let's see, will it fit in my little trimmer? Hot dog it will, whoop whoop. See, it's amazing how much stuff fits in this little guy. Okay, so let's just take a piece I think I'll go this, okay? Ah, there we go. Thank you, little trimmer. <laughs> See, because I was, really, I was just dreading going like, ch -ch 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 -ch. yep, See, I'm one of you guys. You want, you want to have that little gadget, and when you do, you feel validated. I do, I was just like, ah, oh, validated. Okay, so I want my sticky grid. I'm just gonna peel off one side Peel off the other. Okay, I'm just gonna stick this down. I think I'll, I'll work this way, so I think it will be fine. I don't need that magnet. So I don't need any magnets, it's just gonna be sticky grid. I'm going to work on craft for sure for this one. And I don't necessarily, for me personally, um, I don't necessarily care on the card front size at this point. You might, so you might already have like a, a card front decided, but I know that usually when I work, I'm just gonna end up cropping this out. So. I'm just gonna place that still in the corner. I still like the corner, I don't know. Maybe it just makes me feel safe. Take a stamp, all right? I'm not gonna color this whole thing.
because one, one thing I like about this particular set is Cozy Christmas and uh, Zoe did a, a ton of different inspiration on this too, but you can, you can crop this image many different ways. I think Yuko did, I think Anita did. A lot of makers like totally surprised me with how many maker samples we have for this stamp set. Like people I never thought would, would use the set, used it and just used it like amazing. So I hate to sound like a broken record, but you have to really check out the, check out the website and see the inspiration because that, that's what's going to just, I think, help connect the dots with everything. All right, so I'm gonna take Archival because Archival's waterproof. I'm gonna ink this up first. I'm, again, I'm only inking up half because I'm only gonna work with half just to start. We'll take this, stamp it down, and just stamp with purpose. Just get an image. This really is gonna be your outline. So even if you weren't the greatest on this one, that's okay, okay? That's, that's it. Next, we're gonna go in and color. And I'm going to color with my crayons. You have a couple of ways to use them. So I'll just show you just a couple of different ways. First, you can use them direct. And I'll just show you, and I'll, I like to work direct, but I know some people just won't like working direct because a crayon, you can't sharpen it. So it's always gonna have this weird little edge. And if you have something detailed, you might be one of those color in the line people and it, it, this part just won't work for you, right? So you can color direct, which is what I'm going to do because that's what's going to give me the most shine. But you can also just create a palette. And I find that if you're going to use these mica crayons, use the actual craft mat for this because that texture, that tooth, seems to grab more crayon than if you try to do it on the glass. You see how the glass doesn't want to really take much of this? So I prefer to just scribble on onto the craft mat. And what you can do is take a water brush. I'm just gonna use my Distress water brush. It has a nice detail. Come on, focus. There we go. Nice detail, but you could also use a paintbrush. And you're just gonna pick this up. That's what's going to, to dissolve this. And you can color with this. Now, you have some options. One, we can do it this way. Or you'll see what I do. I do a little bit of both, meaning I just put some color down and then I'll use the water brush to actually move that color where I need it to be. So I'm kind of getting the best of both worlds. I'm getting more color slash mica down on my surface, but now I'm getting the flexibility of the water brush, right? There we go. Can you see the difference? So they both shimmer, right? whether it's just watered down, you just get more if you put more down. That's all, just makes sense, okay? So whatever works for you, that's what you need to do. Let me just clean that off, okay. So here we go. I'm just going to take the crayons and I'll start. They just kind of turn up like lipstick. I'll go in and do the leaf. So I'm just going to put, put some color down. I know some people are probably just judge and McJudge at my, my coloring skills, but I like that little bubbling cauldron, little holly branch, fitting color name, isn't it? And I'll hold this up just so you can see like where I'm putting color down. And you can put all your colors down at once, right? You don't have to worry about like putting some down and, and changing or doing whatever. Put a little pine needles over on the pine. I might just throw a little bit at the base there, okay? Then we've got our berries. Take a little winter berry. Wow, it's as if I designed this palette from this stamp, which I did not, but pretty fitting to have that. All right, if you get a, cr if you get a little uh, clump from your crayon, it could happen. Uh, just have a piece of cardstock or you can do tweezer or whatever. Just like pick this up because you want to you want to scoop it up because you don't want that big crayon blob there. Um, and for me, when I try to use my finger, I end up just smearing it all over the place. So, all right. Next, we're going to use a little bit of red. I'm going to do just a dab of this one. So I'm not even really coloring on this. Then for our snowman, let's do his nose in a little jack-o'-lantern. Kind of hard to see, but it'll I'll get there close. It'll be close enough. Little snow flurries on his scarf. Perfect. A little empty tomb on his little hat, right? He's got like a little frying pan hat. That'll be good. We'll do a little flickering candle on the end of his broom. Because he's got a broom. And oh, you know it. What are we going to use for the handle? Crooked broomstick. Well done. See, it's as if I... I'm just actually connecting the dots in my own head right now. So yay me. I'm just going to go around that branch just a little bit. Okay. So that's what, that's all I'm going to put on right now. So could you, could you go in and do the bobble and all that? Sure. I'm, I'm not going to bother. I might bother, but I'm not going to do it right now. Okay. 
So next we're going to take, I don't know, that water brush. Might just said let's bang out 200 of these. Okay, <laughs> I'll put this down. I'll give you the brush. You can start coloring. So there you go. We'll bang out 200. So I'm going to take a water brush and I'm just going to go in and push that color around. Do you have to do this? No, if you're happy with just how that color landed, go for it. But I like, I don't know, for me, I just like stuff a little bit more blended and also just a little bit more random. And I don't mind coloring outside the lines. So, but this allows me really to move that and I'll hold this up just so you can see like where the color is placed versus one that's, that's been blended out. Just so you can see that the crayon does in fact blend. It will always blend, it will always be reactive. That's why drying time is pretty insignificant. Now I'll hold this up so you can see. So see the difference? Look at that shine already. Oh my gosh. But see that one leaf? See, it's just a whole bunch of blobs at this point. But see that water brush just smooths it all out, fills in. So believe it or not, it's super easy. I just like it. I always do. I don't know how to color. I mean, I know how to color. I'm not good at coloring, let's just say. But I like a product that makes it look like I know what I'm doing. And to me, this does, right? These crayons make it very easy for me to blend. I like the fact that that little bit of mica gives it just a sense of I don't know, a sense of wow. Now I'm cleaning my brush off on something nonstick. I don't like to clean a water brush on a paper towel because that sucks all the water out of it, right? So if you're cleaning your water brush, just wipe it off here. It's a self-feeding water brush. So what's nice about this, it has that, that filter system in there and that's what's just going to dispense. You can see just a little water in my hand. That to me is what makes this water brush what it is. You get what you pay for in the water brush world. If you have a water brush, it's just flooding water. Well, that's why, right? You really need something like that. And also I love these synthetic bristles that always remain a point, right? Nothing I hate worse than, you know, you, you have a small paintbrush, but it doesn't come to a point. It's a small paintbrush, but it still doesn't give me any detail control because as soon as I touch it, all the bristles go flaring everywhere. So and I'm just blending some of that for the twig. I don't care, as I said, about going outside the lines. I'm still putting some color down. So let's go in on the nose. So the nose, well, I will say that nose is really, really tiny. So that one will add that little filler. We're gonna take that trick where I can pick up my color. So I'll take some of that jack-o'-lantern and now I'll just go in. And if I want more color, I'm just dabbing it on there. So I'm just dabbing back and forth with the brush. There we go. And we'll take that little bit of blue, move that around the scarf. All right, there we go. And we'll put this in. And I know that like Diane, she loves water brushes. She fills her inks in my water brushes. So thank you, Di, for doing that for years. It's so cool to, you know, she takes her ink sprays, you unscrew it and drip it in. So you could take, yeah, any of your inks and then you have your favorite ink in, in a water pen, you know, once you have it. I mean, is it an investment? Yes, but then you can always refill them. Whereas a lot of times when you buy brush markers, you can't refill those. So think of it that way. And you get to use the colors that you like. All right, take that little crooked broomstick and just take some of that pine needle and push that out. Okay, so here's where I'm at. So I've got my pine and just moving it. I'm gonna get a little bit more water. So you can push where it says push if you ever want more water than what the brush wants to dispense. but you know, only if you really feel that, there we go. I needed to get some of that pigment to dissolve. But other than that, you don't want to press it. The, the, the bristles just know what to do. But sometimes you have a buildup of, of a color or something that you need to move a little bit more. So you can do that. I told you I wasn't going to color that ornament and that's just not, I can't. I just have to. So there we go. Use a little frosted juniper. Just give it kind of a, an AG silvery blue and I'll just push that out there. All right. Just because. And I'll still do, I think I'm gonna do some red. Yeah, let's do some red. Just in those. So see, again, just a dot and I'll push that in. Okay, so, so far, so good. I think, right? Not, not bad, doesn't take long. And again, if you wanted to do this, this could all be like compartmental making, if you will. But now we got this guy. 
So the snowman could be whatever. It, he could totally stay craft, but I didn't want him to stay craft. I wanted to make a white snowman and that's easy to do, but there's so many people that really, I think either are unaware or maybe even forget all of the white products that are in the distress line, right? There are many ways that you can create white from different mediums. So I thought I would do a, a quick little swatch just to show you what you can use to achieve a white finish on craft or dark paper, any of that, okay? So the first one is picket fence. Now the story behind this is this was pre-oxide world, right? Before I even thought of oxide. This was the catalyst for me thinking of oxide, I'll be honest, but this was pre-oxide. So this was called distress ink because that's all we had. And we had a white distress ink called picket fence. And it's the same felt, but it is a white pigment, but it is fluid. It, it, it's kind of, it's liquidy. It's not like a glycerin based pigment. And it's something that the chemist came up with to, to actually have a pigment live in this felt system. And the great thing about it is that you can stamp with it and it dries just like a, a dye ink would. It dries uh, very quick, but you get a wonderful opaque white. Now there are other inks out on the market that are much brighter white than this. This is distress. So I wanted that, that would be, that would be white, but would not be fully opaque. So that is what picket fence is. I, really, there are many other ink pads. So you kind of have to choose the one that you like and why you like it. But the cool thing about this, because people say, are you ever going to have a white oxide? Well, that would be impossible because white is, there's no dye that's white. White is always a pigment. So it, it does get confusing though, because it's in the ink line. But this is the white that is really oxide without color, if you think about that. Okay, so there is picket fence. We can use picket fence by squishing it down there and water coloring with this. And we can, if we layer it, we can get it very white and opaque. But if we water it out, we get a nice gradation of white, right? Very snowy. But we also have this same in spray stain, right? So if you don't have the ink pad, could you use spray stain? Yes, how would you do that? You shake it up, right? Because this one, you have to mix it. But again, it's a stain, not an oxide, because remember, oxides didn't exist at the time. But if you wanted to watercolor with this, you would simply shake it up, unscrew this, and just use that little straw from the schnozzle, the little sprayer, and put a drip down there. Don't spray it on your craft mat if you're gonna watercolor with it, because you will have white everywhere, okay? So a drip is going to be plenty to start watercoloring. So that stain. Well, the difference here, and same rules apply with an ink. An ink is always gonna be more concentrated than a stain. A stain is a fluid version of an ink pad, but this one blends smoother because it's fluid, but it's also less intense because it's not concentrated like an ink pad. So you could use either one, but there is a difference, right? Same thing, you could watercolor with an ink pad versus a stain, but there's a difference. And then we have crayon because we do have a white crayon. So could we do crayon on him the same way we did everything else? You bet we can, right? you can put the crayon down. But the difference on crayon is that the crayon goes from being intense to washed out, just like that. It has, there's no in between on the crayon because we're just dealing uh, with pure pigment. And so once that pigment dissolves, it's dispensed and it's very hard to get a blend with a crayon. You might be better at it than I am, but this was just trying to blend it out. And it essentially, I don't see any gradation of color like I did, but you could. And then of course we have paint and paint is what I focused on last year because it does give me rich opacity. You can see that the paint completely covers the craft paper, but it is also water reactive. So we can watercolor with paint, but once this dries, there is no going back and wetting this out again. That's the thing about distress paint. It's the only distress medium that once it is dry, it is permanent outside of archival, but let's not be splitting hairs here. So distress paint, so the thing about watercoloring, you have to kind of know what you're doing because if you go back and say, oh, I'm gonna thin this out again, if it's already dry, it's done. But those are your options. So there are many different products in the Distress line that you can use to watercolor with white. So I'm going to, I've got some stain there. I'll probably dip into that too, why not? But I'm also just gonna smash my, my ink pad. So I, I love the idea of, of stamping with it. I think it makes some really cool little ways, love that. And we're just gonna do some watercolor. So I'll clean my brush, make sure I don't have like, you know, green or red or whatever. Pick that up just right off the mat and we'll go in and start watercoloring him. Now, one thing I've learned about uh, just watching enough people doing watercolor is if you look at the way a stamp is designed, 
especially if one has some shading, right? Some, some cross hatches, if you will, that's where the color can be more intense. So I usually start there and then I'll go out and just fade that white into the rest of that because I'm using an ink. It's allowing me to continue to go back even after it's dry and I can pick that up and just do some watercolor. I like doing this on craft. Again, it's one of those kind of magic-y magic things where it's like, ooh, how did you get all that color to show up on, on brown? And I'm going right over everything. So you can see that, um, and it's weird when you do this technique because you're trying to like stay in the lines where you go, ooh, I don't wanna go over those buttons. I don't wanna, do it doesn't matter because we're gonna cover that up. So now I'm gonna go into some stain just because a little bit more saturated on my brush right now because it's fluid. And I'll go back into those areas and then I'll just lightly blend that off. Okay, I'm good with that. So far, so good. Done, okay. So next we wanna make sure this is dry. So we're gonna take a heat tool, and this is the part that you have to be careful with about Sticky Grid. Remember when I said it has some, some things I'm not a, when it comes to stamping, because it wasn't designed for that. If you overheat something on Sticky Grid, you will heat up the adhesive, and the adhesive will be all over the back of your cardstock. Um, it's not terrible if you plan on putting that cardstock on something, but you just, so in this case, I'm using a heat tool. I'm just kind of staying away. I'm warming it up. I'm letting it cool down. This way I never get it hot enough to where it becomes a mess, okay? So just know that if you're using sticky grid and you're trying to dry something, use your heat tool, go back, let it cool. It doesn't take very long for it to dry. Um, how do you know if it's dry? If you touch it and it's not wet, then it's dry. So on this one, it's, it's super easy. But remember, nothing's moved because it's been on the sticky grid. Okay, time to stamp. So next we're gonna take our stamp. We're gonna ink it up again in archival, but I'll show you before I do that. I'll just hold up the camera just so you can see. It's colored, but a lot of the detail is kind of, see when the light hits, it gets a little, gets a little covered up. So that's why we wanna do that second stamping layer. So do you always have to do it this way? No way. You can definitely just stamp it once, color it, and be completely done. There's nothing wrong with that. But this little thing, especially if you have a stamp tool, it's, it's just pretty cool. It's a, a, cool, a cool thing to be able to do, right? So I'm just going in, pressing again, not too much pressure. And now we can do the dismount. And look at that. Shut the front door. See the difference? See how detailed that archival black sits on the crayon over the white, over just that big mess of green that I was painting, right? So cool. And this is, this is gonna be cropped, so I could do splatter, I could do whatever, but I love the shimmer of these mica crayons on there. I love that. I love just the, the watercolory, washy look of white, but that double stamping is where it's like, whoo, very, very cool. That to me is, is what I, I love to see. Now, if I'm going to splatter this, right? Maybe I, it, it's a huge difference, right? When you saw it before, that's why I wanted to make sure I held it up to the camera. You would look at it and go, oh, that looks good. I can still see the stamped image. Yeah, I don't need to stamp it again. But if you do, that's where it's like, what? How, I don't, I don't get it. You know, how, like, how is everything so crisp and vivid? Yet, look at those crayons, amazing, right? Um, so for snow, someone asked about snow. If I'm going to splatter, and I will, I'll go and splatter this one, why not? Um, I prefer to splatter in paint because that's going to be my thickest medium. And again, I, I tell you, swatches are your friend. Make one. If you have all these different mediums, make one because that's what's gonna remind you, like that's gonna give me a light image. When Zoe did the off stamping, and correct me if I'm wrong, Zoe, but I, I believe this first layer was paint, right? I could be wrong, but it's, it's really, really opaque. So to me, it's like as opaque as that, that paint is because if it was an ink, it, I just don't know if it would be as opaque. Again, I'm not sure, but it, to me, that's what it looks like. But having that swatch is going to allow you to know what is what, right? Depending on what it is that you wanna work with. Swatches are good. Some people just, they find them a waste of time until you question how is something gonna look and well, I'd rather be able to look at a swatch and go, ooh, okay, that's what it's gonna look like, or then do it and go, oh yeah, bad idea. And now you've kind of gone too far. Yeah, cool, that was a good guess. Just again, because of opacity, could it have been done in any, you know, in the ink pad of the stain? Sure, it could have, right? 
but why? Okay, cleaning that, I've wiped that. We'll lift this off, okay? A lot of fun, let's go in. Let's do, what is this? Have yourself a merry little Christmas, that's cute. Walking, I'll do that, that's charming, right? Why not? Okay, where is, well, I won't do it right now. I'm gonna splatter, because then I gotta wait for that. Okay, get this out of the way, splatter. So for snow, for snow, splatter box, no glitter card in there. There's a splatter box. We're gonna take distress paint. You could take any kind of acrylic paint, so it doesn't have to be distress, but distress is already fluid, right? It has a mixing ball in there, so I wanna really mix it up. I'm going to work with a distress splatter brush. Now you could use a paintbrush. Some people use a paintbrush and flick. Some people uh, use a toothbrush. So you can really, you can use whatever, whatever is your best friend for splattering. I happen to like a splatter brush because I feel that I can control it a little bit more. I'm going to put some paint down. I'm going to sweep it up. Now, if you want your snow flurries to be more faded, then you would use stain because we know from our swatch that stain much like ink becomes very translucent. Paint is going to be more opaque. I want these, these snow boogers to be really strong. So I'm going to just grab in the middle. I pull it back and then I'll slowly let the bristles go as I'm pointing onto my paper. And I'm just, I'm like strumming it. I'm not pulling it back like a bow and arrow and letting it all go at once. I'm literally like strumming the pieces and watching my background and seeing what happens. All right. So here we go. There's a little bit. So I'll show you, there's a tiny little bit. You have to build, there you go. You can see that. There's a little on there, but I want some, I want some more. I always like to start small and then you could always load up the brush, right? Now, the more you flick, like if you flick quick with force, you'll get more of a, more of a little blizzard, I guess. But I, I mean, that's what I'm going for. So it just depends on what, what you like. But see, you can even hear it, right? Can you, I, I don't want to splatter paint all over the window, but See, like that's the, that's the movement. So by doing that little dance, those things are literally, well, you can see the splat box, right? It's like creating a galaxy in there. But I love that because I'm not getting that, often like when I used to use a toothbrush or even a paintbrush, when you, when you do the hit, you just get that big blob. And this just allows stuff to be a little bit more, well, speckly fleckly. I like to say that a lot. But you can see that the paint sits on the surface. This needs to dry. If you touched it right now, those little snow flakes will become snowballs. So you can let it dry or you can use a heat tool. The paint will not retain the dimension, right? It's not a dimensional paint. It will dry flat, but it will dry on the surface because we did not water this down. So that's the big difference, right? That's the big difference. I love this effect. Beautiful, right? It's not completely dry, but it's dry enough for me to show you. So there we go. There's our wonderful mica crayon. And you could mix, right? So you don't have to do all crayon or all paint or all ink, but it is nice to be able to uh, kind of go on and just add that, that finish. Beautiful, right? Super fun. Though. And 199 to go, Mario. You've got gonna this. It is going to take us a while, but... Yeah, that was fun. So hopefully, really, for this demo, this over three hour demo, is that you got some ideas. Um, you know, even if it's just playing around and making some stuff for yourself or, or getting out some of those, maybe some backgrounds that you've already made and you're like, ooh, I'm gonna add some glitter to the tags or you just wanna play around with some texture or you wanna do um, all sorts of different things. There's a, there's a lot of cool things that that we can do. I don't know if you guys are, are sick of me, and if you are, that's that's totally fine, but I'm still gonna share one more thing <laughs> because I really wanna do it. I just really wanna do it because these have all been like cool things to do with stamps and stencils, but when I was playing around with this, something hit me and it, it, it brought me back to when I did this technique the first time and a product wasn't available. And I even think if you went back and watched that video, you would have heard me like hint about Ooh, I wish there was this and this, but there wasn't at the time. So you can see that when it comes to using your stamps, I mean, everything from like that cool Stacy plaid. I mean, come on, how cool is that? Look at all the stuff we've done. We've done all the stamp plaids or you've done festive overlay where you're doing your stamped overlays or gosh, there's buckets everywhere. 
buckets, buckets everywhere. I mean, let us not forget about all of our DIY watercolor and cut, like seriously, so much, right? Or even our smudge. Look at how much stuff we've done in this demo. Like probably more than I even thought we were gonna do. True thing, but that's not enough because I still want to do one more thing. That's how I roll. No okay. Well, if you are, thank you. I understand. Sometimes I get sick of myself, but okay. So there was something that um, 